Next on C-SPAN, you'll hear from the new Interior Secretary, Bruce Babbitt, as he meets with the House Natural Resources Committee. Historically, new Interior Secretaries have addressed committee members to get acquainted and to discuss issues facing the department. This three-hour hearing focused on a wide variety of topics that Mr. Babbitt's agency is dealing with. Mr. Babbitt, of course, was nominated by President Clinton. He's a former Democrat governor of Arizona who ran for the Democratic presidential nomination back in 1988. Tuesday's proceedings were chaired by Representative George Miller of California. Here now is that congressional hearing. The uh, committee... Committee on Interior will come to order. The purpose of today's hearing is to give our new Secretary of Interior, Governor Bruce Babbitt, an opportunity to testify before this, uh, before this committee and to describe some of his concerns and some of his plans for the Department of Interior and then to respond to questions from members of the, uh, of the committee. In the interest of everybody's time and to ma make sure that we are able to maximize the amount of time that is available uh, to members of the committee for the purposes of asking questions, it is the intent of the chair that we would dispense with opening statements and that we would allow uh, Governor Babbitt to, uh, to testify and then we would go right to, uh, uh, right to uh, the, the questioning. And, uh, uh, it's all right with Mr. Hansen. We will proceed in that, uh, in that fashion. Uh, I would just say, Governor, we welcome you. We look forward to your, to your tenure at the, uh, at the department. And uh, uh, as you know and as we'll evolve here today, I think you come at a time when uh, uh, the resources of this nation have never been under more pressure and there's never been more competition for the use of those, uh, of those resources. And uh, we believe it can be an exciting time. We believe that this committee uh, will be central to many of those, uh, of those decisions. And we look uh, forward to your stewardship and to your testimony. And please uh, feel free to proceed in the manner in which you're, uh, uh, you're most comfortable. And uh, welcome. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure to be once again back in front of this committee, uh, this time as Secretary of the Interior. Uh, I've enjoyed enormously working with the committee on all of the usual suspects, the Western issues, reclamation, water, um, Indian issues, uh, and I certainly look forward to, uh, in my new capacity, uh, working with you. I have noted with great admiration the work of the committee uh, on many of these issues and your uh, aggressive and thoughtful stance on uh, water reform on parks, uh, on the great western land issues, as well as uh, many of the other resource issues. There are many, many issues that I could talk about in my opening statement. The conflict between uh, conservation uh, and resource uh, production, uh, the uh, continuing changes uh, in the reclamation uh, activities of the West, uh, offshore oil policy, uh, the very urgent issues relating to uh, Native Americans, including uh, the controversy over Indian gaming, uh, the ongoing water rights issues. Uh, the territories certainly uh, deserve uh, the organization of that effort, the uh, Guam Commonwealth negotiations. Uh, I thought perhaps what I might do, however, is reserve most of the specifics uh, to follow up on questions that any of you uh, may have. And in lieu of a catalog of, of issues in an opening statement, uh, with your leave, what I'd like to do is, is briefly discuss uh, in a uh, larger and perhaps more philosophical way just three issues. Uh, one is the management of the department. Uh, the second is my views on the national park system and the related issues. Uh, and a third, a cross-cutting, uh, but I think extremely important issue, which is the role of science in uh, the department, uh, not only 
at each specific agency, but across the, the department as a whole. The management issues are perhaps a melancholy way to uh, open my presentation to this committee, uh, but I think it's important to acknowledge uh, that there are severe problems. Uh, the problems have been highlighted again and again uh, in reports from the Government Operations Committee uh, and from the Inspector General reports within the Department itself. Uh, the, depart the, the problems include the mismanagement uh, of the Indian Trust Funds, uh, the abuse of the civil service system, uh, recent disclosures regarding the abuse of travel, uh, deficiencies in revenue collection, uh, continuing pervasive difficulties in the Office of uh, Surface Mining. Uh, there are many reasons for all of those problems, and, and among them, I think, is the remarkably decentralized nature of the Department of the Interior. Uh, it has been described as uh, not a department, but six or seven departments uh, or fiefdoms. Uh, obviously, uh, I intend to set out to change that. I believe that uh, I was nominated and confirmed to be Secretary of the Interior. Uh, and I simply assure all of you that I, will, that I take note of and will pay close attention to uh, the deficiencies that have been uh, surfaced in the uh, re reports of this Congress and the Inspector General. Uh, the second issue is the national parks. Uh, the national park system uh, is surely one of the great achievements of this government and this Congress. Uh, national opinion polls, one after another, indicate that the National Park Service is the most widely admired agency uh, in the entire United States government. Uh, and I come to this department with a profound personal attachment uh, to the national park system. I grew up in a small town in northern Arizona, uh, which was intimately related to Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, I uh, have a earth science background and have spent a great deal of time as governor of Arizona uh, trying to put up uh, a state park system that would complement uh, the national park system. The first issue with the parks is, of course, resources. Uh, my budget proposal, which will uh, be out in due course as a part of the President's budget, uh, will show some substantial increases uh, in the budget for the national park system. Uh, I can't describe them as dramatic simply because uh, this is a time uh, of austerity and the Interior Department uh, is doing its share uh, to reflect uh, the President's determination uh, to uh, keep spending down. Uh, within that budget, there will be operational and maintenance increases uh, pretty much across the entire uh, park system, reflecting uh, my intense feeling that we owe it to the American people to have parks uh, that are in good shape with adequate personnel where the trails are open, the buildings are maintained, uh, the infrastructure uh, is in good repair. Uh, there are three California issues which, uh, notwithstanding uh, the presence of, uh, of the chairman, I would offer anyway as illustrations uh, of issues within the national park system. Uh, the first one is the Yosemite concession contract. Uh, I will be prepared to come back uh, very shortly, in no more than a few weeks, uh, to lay before you the issues relating uh, to the concession contract at Yosemite. It's the largest contract in the national park system, and uh, the preceding administration took some commendable steps to try to bring concession contracts uh, into the 20th century with a reasonable return to the government, uh, and uh, in, in that process, uh, more resources uh, for the park system. The Yosemite contract is surely uh, the most important. It's the first one that is up under the new regulations. Uh, I will have some comments and some suggestions uh, to continue what I would call uh, a move toward market, if you will, uh, in the structure of those contracts. I've paid a great deal of attention to the Presidio uh, issues in the San Francisco area. This, as you know, is a site uh, relinquished uh, by the Department of, of Defense 
uh, with enormous potential uh, for incorporation into the uh, urban park system surrounding San Francisco. It brings with it enormous budget implications, uh, which I think we will see reflected and repeated in many of the urban uh, parks uh, that will have to be dealt with, and we're going to have to uh, invent uh, some thoughtful and compatible uses for many of the facilities uh, uh, within that area. I will be ready to come before this committee in the very near future on the California desert legislation. Now, the administration uh, supports the California desert bills in concept that have been advanced uh, by both Mr. Lehman and uh, Senator Feinstein. Uh, we have uh, nearly completed our analysis of those bills and will be prepared uh, virtually at your call uh, to step forward and uh, testify on California desert, uh, evincing our belief that the national park system can and should be expanded uh, and that there are roles uh, for the Bureau of Land Management as well in the administration uh, of these and other lands in the West. I think it's important to continue to advocate expansion of the national park system. Uh, the demand, the user demand, has gone up, has continued to skyrocket across the years. Uh, the national park system is no longer a sort of western system of large uh, crown jewel parks, if you will. Uh, it is now a concept uh, which has created admiration, support, and demand across the United States. Uh, and I will be before this committee advocating a judicious, prioritized expansion of that system. Uh, mindful always that expansion creates uh, additional budget demands. Equally mindful of the importance of that expansion process. Uh, I will be focusing on ways to expand and infill the national park system uh, through the use of land exchanges. Uh, this committee has legislated on the land exchange issue in, in recent years. Uh, I continue to believe out of my own experience uh, that in addition to the land and water trust fund uh, for outright acquisition, that the use of the public land base for infill and expansion of the park system uh, is a powerful way in times of budget austerity to continue this process. Uh, as an example of that, I would cite two states, Wyoming and Utah, both of which uh, are developing uh, exchange proposals that have large implications, not only for the national parks, but for the public land base as a way of getting rid of uh, inholdings in the public land base that were created by, by loose election, indemnification, uh, and uh, other kinds of public land policies. Lastly, a word about the role of science in the uh, conduct of this department. This is an issue which is coming up in many, many different ways. Uh, the, the role of science in the national park system has been raised by Chairman Vento, uh, by a study uh, put out by the National Academy. Uh, it's treated extensively in the uh, Vail report, which was issued uh, on the 75th anniversary of the national park system. Uh, as it relates to parks, uh, the critique with which I agree is that uh, the lack of scientific capacity in the park system uh, has uh, badly handicapped uh, resource decision making. Uh, the parks have not entirely fulfilled their obligations under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, we've had uh, intense controversies with respect to uh, activities outside the parks impinging upon the uh, function and the pristine nature of the parks. Most recently and uh, perhaps notably the uh, air pollution issues at Grand Canyon National Park, uh, the administration of uh, the Glen Canyon Dam upstream on the Colorado River. There are similar issues in most of the other agencies that I am now responsible for. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management needs an increased science capacity uh, for good land management. They also need it to meet their obligations under Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, there are many federal agencies, including in my own department, uh, which have not entirely, or in, in many cases, not even reasonably, 
uh, met their consultation and management obligations under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, has an obvious and important link uh, to the science issues. Uh, as I know you are aware, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, as the frontline agency in charge of administering the Endangered Species Act, uh, has by court settlement taken on an enormous added burden uh, for uh, the listing and the preparation of recovery plans for another uh, 400 species in addition to ones that will arise in due course. The other issue with respect to the use of science in the Fish and Wildlife Service <clears throat> is my feeling that we must get control of the Endangered Species Act process by proactive front-end administration of that act. Uh, and what that means is rather than focusing on single species as they spiral toward extinction, we need to step back and look at the entire ecosystem and ask, is it possible to intervene before the crisis? Is it possible to look at habitat management that will prevent that crisis, uh, to do it on the basis not just of one species, but of the entire ecosystem. Uh, there have been some successes uh, <clears throat> in some parts of California, <clears throat> excuse me, and elsewhere with that approach. <clears throat> excuse me. It does, however, require uh, an added emphasis on the scientific capacity of the agency. Uh, in describing those particular issues, I think I draw you inevitably toward a larger conclusion, and that is that this department needs a scientific research capacity that transcends the needs of individual agencies, because in fact, uh, the ecosystem problems don't stop at the boundaries of BLM jurisdiction, of the Park Service jurisdiction, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, or any of the other agencies. Uh, and uh, I have a series of studies underway designed to answer the question, is there some way that we can answer these needs by drawing together a coordinated effort uh, which we can use uh, to fulfill all of these responsibilities and which will draw the research capacity and the information together uh, on a more systemic basis uh, on an ecosystem basis, if you will, uh, to see if we can't put together and integrate something resembling a biological survey, uh, which perhaps uh, can be conceptualized by analysis uh, or, or by uh, analog to the United States Geological Survey, uh, which was created a century ago out of disparate agencies within the department in recognition of the need for uh, science which transcends uh, jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with those remarks, uh, I would simply uh, summarize by saying I look forward to working with this committee. Uh, I think we are uh, at a time uh, where a great deal can be done. There's public support uh, for uh, moving ahead on these issues. Uh, the land use issues, the water issues, the regulatory issues uh, are ripe for reconsideration. Uh, this administration has repeatedly uh, stated its belief, which I share, that uh, resource uh, development, the creation of jobs, the sustaining of communities can be reconciled with a high degree of environmental protection and that we now have the chance in the administration of the department and in the legislative agenda of this committee uh, to prove to the American people that we can be uh, in the business of both creating jobs uh, and being stewards of the resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, uh, your testimony, I think, comes at, at a very uh, crucial and opportune time for this uh, agency, the Department of Interior. Uh, as you have quite correctly outlined, uh, the Western environment, as you say in, in, in your statement, which what's, once seemed limitless, now appears to be a vast and complex but fragile web, I think is, is clearly a, a correct assessment 
of the West, where this committee spends most of its time, although Mr. Markey and others will drag us back to the other side of the Mississippi. But uh, it has changed dramatically over the last 25 years. And it is under more pressure than ever before, whether it's our national park system or our forest lands or our grazing lands or the competition between economic interest and environmental interest. And I think that uh, recognizing that is one of the most important steps to reconciling the differences that exist. I think everybody on this committee, Mr. Secretary, believes that in fact they can be reconciled, uh, that we need not be forced into uh, uh, all or nothing choices on either side of the, uh, uh, of the ledger uh, that, as you point out, uh, very often we have got to look at the, uh, at the impacts of these decisions on regional economies, on local economies, and at the same time we have to look at the impact of the decisions of this committee and the administration uh, with respect to regional environments and local environments, if you will. But uh, we have always believed that they, in fact, could be, uh, could be reconciled. But you touch on two very important points in your, in your testimony, and that is the role in the management of the department. I think many people who were involved uh, very, very extensively over the last two years, and some longer, uh, in, in the issue of the spotted owl and the, and the, and the problems of the, of the Northwest will simply tell you that we, there was a failure of cooperation within the departments, agencies, and bureaus that had responsibility to work together. And that can no longer, that is a luxury, and that can no longer be, be tolerated, the management within the department so that everybody's pulling in one direction will be very, very important to, uh, to this committee in trying to resolve those, uh, those issues. And the other is science. Uh, not terribly sexy in the, in, in, the, in the history of the Department of Interior, but all the more important in terms of resolving issues and maybe even more important in terms of getting answers to questions being asked uh, about these issues from our districts, from our states, from impacted areas as to what is the best solution and how can we provide some certainty for those varied interests, for a sustainable environment and a sustainable economy. And uh, the role of science, uh, the understanding of it, as we have seen in a number of these fights, uh, we, we, have we have become smarter uh, about some of the issues. We now are starting to recognize that we don't have to respond on a species-by-species -species basis where there's a never-ending discussion, debate, and loggerheads where we may be able to develop uh, 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 in, uh, uh, ecosystems uh, that answer and provide certainty for a greater length of, uh, of time. Uh, at the same time, that science must not be manipulated politically. And uh, I would have to tell you that this committee has spent a considerable amount of time uh, on that issue, on the manipulation of that science to one end or to the, uh, to the other. And I would hope that we would not see a repeat of that in, uh, in this administration. Uh, it's tough sometimes to accept uh, objective uh, uh, answers to our, uh, to our questions, but uh, it's also important to do that. And uh, I think that you raise these issues on a, on a very timely uh, basis for the, for, the, for the proper deliberation uh, of, this, uh, of this committee. Uh, we have spirited fights in this committee, and we have, uh, uh, we have spirited debate. And uh, because these issues are not, uh, not esoteric, they're not abstract, they almost immediately affect each and every member's district, constituency, uh, 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 on an ongoing basis. And it's for that reason that we need the best evidence. It's for that reason that we need the most open debate so that members can, in fact, be heard, whether they win or lose in that, uh, in that argument. We think that your, uh, uh, your department uh, uh, can be very helpful in that, uh, in that debate in sorting out some of these differences and responding on a timely basis. And I'm... Uh, I'm delighted to hear the, your, uh, your outlining of uh, your, your willingness and, and ability to respond shortly on the issues of the California desert and the Yosemite contract and other issues that, uh, that we, we need to address uh, immediately. So let me just, uh, I will hold my questions uh, and let other members, but let me again welcome you and we look forward to your, uh, uh, to your tenure. Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for uh, doing away with the opening statements. 
As you can see, Mr. You'll only get one is the point. You either get an opening statement this or a is question. No, welcome, Mr. Secretary. And uh, first let me uh, compliment you on um, giving me a call about a month ago, and that was a good step forward. It made me feel as if we're going to be part of this, although we'll have our disagreements. At least we have an open door, and I want to congratulate you on that. Uh, I'm going to ask one question, Mr. Secretary, and then uh, I know there's a, because we are so much involved with your department in my state, that uh, this is a question that means a great deal to me, um, because I think you have some sympathy in the area which I'm going to address the question. In 1971, you know, we had the Alaska Native Land Claim Settlement, the largest settlement that any one individual group, 12 regions, actually 13 regions, received. And we were given, they were given, my constituents were given 44 million acres of land. But it was in the Department of Interior, regardless of administration, and I've been under six presidents now, um, I think there's been a misinterpretation of Section 22G, whereby on one hand we gave the, the first Americans uh, a, a settlement uh, for their social and economic well-being. On the other hand, because of your department now, it's your department, it was Nixon's department, it was Ford's department, it was Carter's department, it was Reagan's department, it was Bush department, all the secretaries in them, but now it's your Mr. President Clinton and your department. And I certainly would like to see uh, you to communicate with the Fish and Wildlife Service to fulfill that obligation to my Alaska natives. I have about uh, 25 different cases where they say, if, for instance, in the Kenai Peninsula, where there's been an agreement with everybody that the best land that is there could be exchanged with the fish and wildlife. And yet, for some reason, the fish and wildlife say, oh, no, we don't want to exchange it, but you can't do anything with your land. Now, that's not fair. And I hope that you will, will help me encourage the Fish and Wildlife Department to have the exchanges wherever possible, or allow them to use those lands, because I'm going to inter introduce legislation to have that occur, because it is not fair to the first Americans, it's not the intent of this Congress, and, I, and it's, I'm not laying this burden on you, but you can be of help to me, and I think fulfill the obligation of this Congress, and whoever the President may be to the first Americans, that's my Alaska natives. And so that's what I'm placing, you know, not a question, but a statement. I'd like to have your, your input as time goes by. Please look at this solution, because we've been arguing and discussing with the administrations over the years, and they always play this cutesy game because they are the government. And I think there's a way to solve this problem. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Sharp. Mr. Secretary, I'm uh, <clears throat> very delighted with your appointment and look forward to working with you uh, uh, in hopes of... Uh, dealing with many of these complex issues of working out how we are good stewards of the uh, public uh, resources. Uh, one issue, um, since I don't come from a district in which your department immediately makes decisions that have a great impact, uh, we don't have any federal lands in my district. I'm one of two or three around here who uh, uh, have a different perspective uh, sometimes. Um, uh, I'd just like to raise with you uh, an issue that you have um, uh, that, that fits into this pattern of how we work out these problems. That is, uh, take for example OCS uh, drilling for uh, oil and natural gas resources. Um, we've struggled with this for some years uh, in the country uh, and uh, now we have in place a number of moratoria uh, which are sort of uh, broad political statements that generally were not based upon any particular negotiation, any particular scientific examination, any particular a review of uh, either the environmental side of the equation or the, the the industry side of the equation because we could never come to grips with it very easily. Uh, one of your predecessors was going to throw the entire OCS open to all kinds of drilling and it was an outrageous move which re got a response uh, of intense political opposition and drive to shut down uh, many areas or at least make them off limits. Uh, and as a result, we still have in the law now several moratoria that at some point you, the Department and the Congress, will have to come to grips with as to whether we extend them or whether we uh, uh, alter them. Uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention the fact that an effort was made through the Institute of Resource Management, something that uh, Robert Redford had founded, uh, to negotiate out uh, this kind of an issue. And a remarkable achievement occurred that, unfortunately, uh, another one of your predecessors uh, who publicly praised but then decided not to act upon it, uh, blew the, uh, the negotiation apart. 
But indeed, taking an example of the Bering Sea, uh, bringing together representatives of Alaskan American natives, uh, bringing together representatives of the fishing industry, bringing together uh, oil drillers, the major oil drillers in the country, bringing together the major uh, environmental litigators, uh, actually worked out an agreement as to what areas uh, would be acceptable from the environmental and fishing and native point of view to be uh, uh, drilled and uh, from and what areas would be out of bounds for drilling. Uh, one side agreeing that if you let us drill, uh, we'll, we won't press for any more area. Uh, and the other side agreeing that uh, if you'll stick in those areas, uh, we won't litigate. Uh, and it was a rather remarkable achievement that many people think is impossible in this society. Uh, I would suggest to you that this process has some utility, but it takes time. It takes a, it's a struggle to get it organized. And you have some time before these moratoria uh, come off. And I know everything else will rush <laughs> to fill that time. Uh, uh, and it's awfully hard to get ahead of the curve. But I would strongly urge uh, your department to begin looking at some of these uh, longer term deadlines that you have in hopes of bringing the, uh, the competing interests uh, together to uh, begin to work out some of these problems. And I think it's a way that we can um, uh, manage some of these conflicts and I would uh, commend it to you. You certainly have done this kind of thing yourself, I know, in many ways and uh, uh, I hope that we can uh, work together on that kind of thing. Mr. Sharp, uh, this is surely the ultimate arena of to test anyone's skills in, in conflict resolution. My sense is that as a result of the overly aggressive leasing policies of the 80s, where the department's policies got way ahead of public opinion, uh, a backlash has developed with some unfortunate consequences, not the least of which is uh, that the department is now faced with the possibility of buying leases back uh, in areas uh, that are now covered by the moratoria. Uh, the lesson of that episode, I think, is that from here on out, uh, we've got to analyze these issues with a great deal of care. Uh, we must be uh, absolutely intense about running the existing operations to the highest degree of environmental safety that we possibly can, uh, and uh, then uh, see if uh, there is any kind of pattern uh, below the moratoria that, uh, where we could reach a public consensus. That is, some areas, uh, Bristol Bay, for example, certainly at the top, are, uh, by consensus of everyone involved, uh, off limits to drilling. Uh, and then move back toward existing areas and ask whether there are uh, any areas where uh, the uh, environmental indicators, the economic indicators, and public opinion uh, would support any kind of expansion. That's going to be a lengthy process, and my, my instinct at this point uh, is to come back to you uh, with a, a 1994 budget uh, which continues uh, the moratoria in the, uh, uh, that are currently in existence. Uh, I'm not certain that's an ideal way to conduct business, uh, but until there's time to re-examine all this question, I'm not sure that I have a better one. Mr. Markey. Thank you. Um, uh, I, as well, want to welcome you, Mr. Secretary. I think that President Clinton has appointed the best possible person uh, in our country to be responsible uh, in the 1990s for the stewardships of the public lands of the United States. And I want to compliment him and, and thank you for your willingness to take on this assignment. I think it's one of the most important that uh, our country faces over the next decade. Um, I, uh, as well as the other members here today, will, I think, be focusing more upon issues that are of narrow interest to each of us. But uh, I, I think each of us, as well, understands that it's all part of this larger system which you speak. And uh, I want to work with you in helping to preserve and uh, expand uh, that uh, national ecosystem. Uh, the Outer Continental Shelf issues off of the Massachusetts coast, George's Bank, an issue of continuing controversy, one which uh, right now is resolved and one which we believe uh, does balance the interests uh, between energy development and uh, the, uh, uh, the natural ecosystem off of the coast of Massachusetts and other parts of the country. 
Um, inside of my own district, the Department of Interior, of course, would have uh, jurisdiction over the uh, Lexington, uh, Massachusetts uh, uh, Common, where the uh, shot heard around the world on the uh, Lexington Green and many other locations in my district where, which have historical importance for the country. Um, just north of my district, the Lowell Urban National Park, which was not such an obvious site for Department of Interior uh, stewardship, but which I think now serves as a model for a more imaginative use of Department of Interior uh, resources. Uh, and, uh, and some people will make allusion to this, but even the concern which I have that many other urban park areas, uh, including Revere Beach, which is in my district and is the uh, first public beach in the United States, uh, I think is deserving of more attention uh, by the federal government in terms of understanding how important it is to the uh, national fabric of environmental and recreational uh, areas that our government has to uh, pay attention to on an ongoing basis. So I think most of us are going to be on our best behavior today. Uh, we'll think of this more in the nature of a weigh-in before the fight begins uh, as you're sitting down there. But you will, I think, uh, enjoy coming before this committee. The issues are framed sometimes in, the, in polar uh, opposites, but um, I think in the end uh, we can uh, over the next four years uh, reconcile many of the differences and, and create a better environment for the country. I thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Markey, your, your comments remind me of something that Senator Byrd told me uh, when I uh, was discussing my preliminary budget on the Senate side. Uh, he said that last year he had 3,000 member requests for uh, parks and other facilities. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in the United States. And, and I say that uh, by way of underlining two issues. One is, uh, I believe that's a genuine reflection of popular and public demand for parks and recreational facilities and the preservation of historic sites, battlefields, and open space in the United States. An important statement. Uh, I think it also suggests the difficult but necessary task that I have of trying to prioritize uh, where it is we go uh, in the national park uh, uh, system. And uh, I look forward to doing battle with all of you uh, in that <laughs> process. Mr. Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we appreciate having you before us and welcome you here. And thank you for your opening remarks. I remember 13 years ago, uh, there was another man sitting there by the name of Jim Watt. The papers looked at him as the extreme right, and now I've, they're looking at you as extreme left. I hope that's not the case. I hope that now that you wear this hat, that you can see that, uh, especially coming from the state of Arizona, contiguous to my state of Utah, that those people have some rights too. And on the multiple use question that has come up, I've noticed what you've said about it. I've read your articles. I hope that we realize that the folks who live in the West, those who ranch, those who have mines, those who cut timber, that in an environmentally safe way that they have a right to exist. I hope that what you've stated about the Reclamation Act is a little different now that you're wearing a different hat. As my years on this committee, I don't know of one state that's received more on reclamation than the state of Arizona. And last time, as we did the omnibus bill that Chairman Miller put through, our good friend uh, Jay Rhodes had another piece in there for Arizona and reclamation. I appreciate your comments on the Endangered Species Act and what you said about it. I hope that we all realize that this thing wasn't from Mount Sinai. It wasn't from the hand of God. It's got a lot of imperfections in it. The idea of the taking, which seems to me, coming as a governor from the state, and I was Speaker of the House when Governor Matheson, your good friend, was Speaker. It was. Uh, Chair, uh, governor from Utah, we could see the necessity of some things being changed. From time to time, they have to be. But you used, probably used to use eminent domain. We used it all the time in the state legislature. We used it also in city councils where I've served. Seems to me it's kind of a tragedy as we see this. I realize we're in the honeymoon period. I agree with my friend, Mr. Markey, that we'll go easy today and not bring these things up. But gee, I'd sure like to have some answers to these. I think a lot of us would like to have some answers to them. 
You're very close to the Grand Canyon from your opening remarks. I am too. I've flown down it. I've gone down the river a dozen times. I've walked across it. Uh, I have a love affair with the Grand Canyon like most people in the West do. Really tough questions coming up there. Again, the Endangered Species Act. That first section from the dam down to Lee's Ferry, probably the best fishery there is in America now. And yet, if we followed this strict letter of the Endangered Species Act, we'd have to take all those trout out, all the rainbows, the brown, the cutthroat, and we'd be down to a position of trash fish. Somewhere, I hope that in your wisdom, you can solve these problems. Do we put motors on it so more people can enjoy it? Things such as that. <coughs> Mr. Secretary, many of us will agree that it's very important that we work together for the good of the West. And those of who have states like we do, 73% owned by the federal government, we want to work with you and we extend the hand of friendship. We would hope that we could do this in a way that is environmentally sound and yet does not hurt our economy in those states. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity of an open remark. Mr. Murphy. Congressman, there is much to respond to in those remarks. If I might just say a word about the endangered species issue. Uh, by way of emphasizing my view that we get into these problems because of the lack of a proactive effort to deal with the problems before the crisis. Uh, and by way of illustration, uh, I will be required by court order to begin listing a number of species with tremendous consequences uh, for a variety of, of, of areas. The first one is the Delta smelt. Uh, in the California Bay Delta. Uh, I can honored. tell you that I will be required. <laughs> no, I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> now, I met with Governor Wilson several weeks ago to, uh, I don't think he was thrilled at the prospect uh, of that listing. But the point that I made to him was that we should have been at work over the last five years under the existing provisions of the Endangered Species Act to try to devise a habitat conservation plan to avert the listing. Now, that does require an investment in science and analysis of the entire system, uh, in that case, the water system of the Bay Delta. Unfortunately, that wasn't done, and now we're going to be doing it under strict legal deadlines and court-driven process. Uh, coming closer to Utah, I must tell you, for better or for worse, that I read the court orders uh, and the processes that were set in motion in the prior administration uh, as now uh, virtually, certainly, requiring me to list the Mexican spotted owl uh, as an endangered species with consequences for Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. Again, one reason that that listing must now take place, uh, I believe, under judicial mandate, is that the Interior Department and the United States Forest Service fell at swords points uh, in an attempt to put something together. They simply, uh, over the past years, have, have taken the position uh, that they'd rather not cooperate and leave it to the courts. Uh, I am now left to deal with that, and of course I will. Uh, my uh, conclusion, again, is that with the help of this committee uh, and with some good, comprehensive science, I believe that the Endangered Species Act can be made to work in a proactive way to avert these crises. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor, uh, thank you for accepting the tremendous task of caring for our natural resources, and thank you for devoting to us uh, your morning. I was pleased to see in your opening remarks that you mentioned the 1872 Mining Act. In the last session of Congress, Chairman Rahal guided uh, the reform of that act through the committee, and we hope that we'll have uh, your leadership and support in, in tackling that uh, job this year. I want to join uh, uh, my colleague, Mr. Markey, in saying there, uh, there is a need for uh, the Interior Department east of the Mississippi River. Uh, our land uh, may come a little higher in price, but we feel that uh, when you seek your priorities, you'll take into consideration that we do have several requests to uh, make small expansions in our Civil War battlefields and, uh, and some of our revolutionary uh, uh, battlefields. We certainly need uh, more open space in the East, and we look forward to your guidance. 
Uh, that would be one issue I, I hope you address. The second is that timber is a renewable resource, and I hope that you'll uh, accept that philosophy and allow us to uh, perhaps harvest the timber, uh, manage it correctly so that we can, uh, uh, the cost of lumber is going up, uh, uh, the building uh, does not subside in this country, and uh, it's also a, a good product for export. If we can properly raise, manage, and harvest our timber, I think we will be able to face the uh, needs of the next century. So I hope that you will address those two issues. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rahal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I join with my other colleagues in welcoming you to the committee today. Appreciate the time you've taken. Uh, my efforts uh, during the last several, several years on this committee have been in basically three efforts, uh, three areas, rather. One is the Office of Surface Mining, two is National Park Service, and three has been the mining law reform. In regard to the problems that have plagued the Office of Surface, surface Mining over the last uh, decade or so, I feel we've gone a long way in correcting a great many of those problems in last year's energy bill. And I don't foresee this committee spending as much time in playing cat and mouse games with uh, whomever the new director of that OSM is as we have over the past years. I think uh, under your leadership we're going to see honesty, we're going to see uh, uh, a straightforward opinion being expressed, and we're not going to have to wait around for years and years to get our questions answered as we did uh, during the last years. So um, I salute you for bringing the new fresh air to the department, and uh, I'm sure that it will prevail down through into the Office of Surface Mining. In regard to the National Park Service, uh, my efforts there, of course, has been to acquire as much land for the Park Service as possible in my home state of West Virginia. And in that regard, I do invite you down to our state to raft our New River or Golly River in the fall, experience our whitewater rafting and all its pleasures, and would be glad to uh, work with you and accommodate your schedule uh, in that regard. Uh, we uh, don't have any cactuses in West Virginia, or cacti, I guess, like you do in Arizona. <laughs> We do have real trees. We have manly trees, Mr. Secretary, oaks and maples. <laughs> you see the problem we have on this committee, real trees. Not like all this. And contrary to popular opinion, uh, Mr. Secretary, we do still have topsoil remaining and has not been all stripped away from past strip mining practices. And, and we have uh, real dirt, too, I might add, not sand, real dirt. <laughs> And I might say, uh, Mr. Secretary, if uh, we are fortunate to host you uh, for a whitewater rafting trip, that we would only drive by the Greenbrier, which is in my district as well. We would not stop and spend any time there. Uh, I did, <laughs> okay, I did forego the opportunity to open a district office in the Greenbrier, so that means that bombed-out shelter we've heard so much about is still available, and uh, probably the rent on it is rather cheap these days. So if you can uh, perhaps find some significant historical or, or uh, other value that we can preserve that shelter, I'm sure uh, we would welcome that, uh, as that is now in my district as well. In conclusion, uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I did note your comments in regard to a call for a comprehensive reform in the mining law of 1872. Uh, I salute uh, your statement in that regard and certainly look forward to working with you. Uh, we did, as you've noted, come very close in the last session of Congress to passing such a bill out of the House of Representatives, and I hope we can do that in the first hundred days of, of this administration. Uh, the only uh, addition I would make to your comments in that regard is that you could have said, uh, let's all pass Ray Hall's H.R. 322 with no amendments. Thank you. His, Thank his fourth Mr. Congressman, I, I accept the invitation to uh, <laughs> visit West Virginia with pleasure. Great. Uh, my Great. wife's home state and... Uh, I'm eager to return. Great. Mr. Rahal's fourth effort in this committee has been the Board of Tourism for West Virginia, but we won't <laughs> get into, we won't get into that. Uh, Mr. Mikonovich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, certainly I welcome you, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary, and appreciate your coming. As uh, has been noted, there are some uh, very severe conflicts on this committee, and of course, uh, Congressman Rahal and I have a few disagreements on the mining law. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you know that my state is 87% federally owned and 68% of those are BLM lands uh, alone. So in effect, you're the landlord of my state. And um, 
obviously the things that I think all of us are hoping for is that we will have an opportunity for consultation with you and uh, also with the people that I represent. Um, you know, I, I think I sense that we're not going to um, try to put you on the spot today and ask a lot of very uh, tough questions, but I have to point out to you that there are some some really serious concerns that we have, and I noticed in your statement that you said a remaining problem with the mining law is a lack of secure tenure for uh, mineral exploration. and. Um, and you know, all of us feel that is one of the problems, and, and you may have a different view of it than we do. Um, one of the other big concerns that I have is an 8% gross royalty fee that is being proposed in both uh, Mr. Rahal's and Mr. Bumper's uh, bills. Um, I see that this would just be an invitation for people in my state to go south, go down to Latin America. Uh, again, I'm not asking you for any uh, answers on these questions, but um, uh, I hope that we'll have an opportunity to make our points. I, I spoke just yesterday to um, the American Mining, um, the uh, Society of Mineral uh, Exploration people in my district. There were probably 3,000 people there, and they're all learning to speak Spanish, which gives me a, a, a very bad feeling, frankly. They uh, see that they're going to be driven off the public lands in my state. Um, uh, obviously, you've heard uh, from uh, other members of the committee about how we feel about multiple use of public lands, and I want to know what that means to you. Um, I think you may have a, a little different uh, feeling about the multiple use of public lands, and I think um, when you spoke to the American Mining Congress, you talked about your commitment to revise or even remove the multiple use management of public lands, and, and this troubles me. So I guess I'm not ans asking you for any uh, answers at this particular time, but I think that uh, all of the people who are on my side of this aisle who represent a lot of the western areas are very concerned about these issues. So I just wanted to reiterate them. You've heard them before from me. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Vukanovic, if I may, I, <clears throat> I would like to uh, at least make brief answers to your questions and <clears throat> assure you uh, that I am not really as scary as you intimate and suggest that you certainly appreciate that from our prior history of working of together course. on uh, uh, Nevada issues. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. I, I spoke last week uh, also with the American Mining Congress yes, about the uh, reform of the mining law of 1872. Uh, what I said to the American Mining Congress, I would repeat here, and that is that it's my sense that the mining issue has really reached the point at which it ought to be uh, uh, resolved, that with a new administration, uh, with this issue, uh, causing an acrimonious dispute year after year after year, this is probably a good time uh, to try to draw it toward conclusion. Uh, what I said to the Mining Congress on the royalty issue was, uh, you should look about this country, uh, listen to the President's budget proposals, reflect upon uh, the commitment that we have all made to try to get a fair return on public resources, whether they be uh, water, grazing, mining, or timber. Uh, now, uh, perhaps to Mr. Rahal's disappointment, I conspicuously omitted any mention of numbers uh, in my remarks to the American Mining Congress. Uh, I thought that was a conspicuous olive branch that I offered my friends in the mining industry, saying to them that uh, Mr. Rahal's proposal, in my judgment, uh, was not handed down from the mount, and equally that the American Mining Congress ought to uh, float out some, uh, some responses or some ideas, and that I'm willing uh, to step into that fray and uh, begin the process of uh, seeing if I can facilitate some kind of a reasonable solution, wherever that may be. Uh, now, with respect to multiple use, uh, let me just say again, I recognize that multiple use is uh, the law of the land in FLIPMA and in the Forest Service uh, legislation. 
Uh, it is equally my view that uh, in many areas, multiple use is breaking down because you can't literally mine, have stock, watershed, uh, increasing uh, recreational demands on every acre of land. And that uh, we really have two choices as urbanization of the West creates these intense demands that can't always be reconciled under the uh, title of multiple use. One is to leave it to me to solve them. Uh, I don't know whether that's a scary prospect or not, but I, I don't really think I it is. On that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the other one is to address it as a legislative issue. Uh, and I'm obviously uh, open uh, to either pathway. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Bento. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman and uh, Governor Babbitt. Uh, it is uh, really a joy to uh, hear the, uh, the, uh, the, the words this morning that, uh, that you've spoken, not simply because uh, I find some agreement with them, but I think really because it's uh, evident to me that you are engaged uh, uh, in the issues, that you understand them. You may well not agree with uh, uh, the policy path that I might lay out or, or others on the uh, committee, but it's uh, apparent to me uh, in, the, uh, in the brief uh, one hour that we spent this morning that uh, you have uh, a good insight and a good start uh, on gaining an insight, an open mind, and uh, uh, frankly, a lot of empathy uh, uh, and sensitivity to the issues that I have to face as a, a subcommittee chairman or that Chairman Miller has to face and other members on this committee. Uh, this is very much a committee that uh, by law and by, by uh, jurisdiction has responsibility to deal with an enormous number of issues in a, a given legislative session. That's the way we reserved it because we want to be involved in terms of the issues that affect the people we represent. And uh, it's apparent to me uh, and uh, from the, what you've outlined here that you do have and will have a legislative program. That is something that will affect the BLM, the Park Service, the Bureau of Rec, uh, many others, and that's, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, very often, I think, in the past, Mr. Chairman and my, my colleagues, that uh, uh, if you don't have a map as to where you're going, any direction that you take off would seem all right. And uh, we often, I think, found ourselves responding to crisis or responding to, uh, uh, to other than a, uh, a plan that uh, was forthcoming from the administration. Again, I hope it's one uh, that I can agree with, but in any case, I think it puts you uh, a long way ahead of the, uh, the uh, uh, issues uh, and the problems that you face. We do, we do have a minefield of problems out there. I think you've, you've touched on some of them, and uh, I look forward to working with you in terms of those uh, issues. One of the first things that uh, is going to come up, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond briefly to this, is the president uh, last night and tomorrow night will specifically, in general last night and specifically tomorrow night, is going to put forth a stimulus program. And I'm wondering if you can identify for us today any areas that you've had input in with regards to where you're pushing for additional resources as it affects the, uh, the Department of Interior, <coughs> Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Venno, yes, I have uh, been in on that process and uh, advocated departmental needs in two specific areas. The first and most obvious one is parks. Uh, I uh, am not at liberty to uh, disclose the final package, and I'm not even, I've not even seen the, the final <coughs> package which will be relief, released. Uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, there will be a response to my requests that uh, we use the uh, stimulus package to do infrastructure repair in the National Park system. Facilities, maintenance, trails. Uh, there is a $6 billion backlog of infrastructure, maintenance, repair, and construction needs in the National Park system. Uh, they are, I think, uh, ideally suited to stimulus because many of them uh, are literally ready to go to contract uh, and the job creation uh, which is the idea of the, the, the rapid job creation behind the stimulus concept uh, seems to apply very well here. Uh, the other area where I have uh, had some extensive discussions uh, is with respect to the Indian reservations where infrastructure uh, is needed in the most basic sense, paving roads, rural airstrips, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, the repair of school facilities, and uh, I am 
uh, confident that we will see a response to those requests uh, precisely because they are uh, large, urgent, and uh, unmet. Well, Mr. Secretary, we appreciate the response and the uh, effort that you have made to advocate for your department and obviously the issues that are, are familiar with, uh, with the uh, members of the committee. I want to say that <clears throat> your emphasis and your thoughtful remarks with regards to parks are, are very helpful uh, uh, to me and uh, the discussion about <clears throat> science in the uh, department is, uh, is helpful. <clears throat> Pardon me. Very often I think it's assumed if we all have the same information that we have, uh, we're going to come to the same conclusion. I think that that doesn't necessarily follow, but I think having a common base of, uh, of information, uh, scientific information that's objective, uh, uh, may uh, uh, arm us better to deal with uh, uh, establishing uh, the right policies. I think this is especially true with public lands. I think one of the statements that uh, you have to reconcile is that very often in the past uh, we've had uh, overly optimistic and I might say unscientific uh, data with regards to the amount of uh, timber production, the impact, for instance, of land use uh, processes uh, in mining. And uh, the process goes on and uh, without adequate information you're obviously uh, uh, setting uh, up the department and the land policy uh, management uh, for uh, uh, shortcomings and really for harm to the uh, to our national heritage uh, in many, uh, many instances, whether it's grazing or other factors that uh, are involved. So I think one of our jobs is to try to reestablish that. Uh, one way to do that is through some reauthorization of law, perhaps through an initiative, it sounds like, dealing with science. I know specifically that Director Reidenauer had a specific objective in terms of cooperative research with the universities and parks, which I would suggest that uh, we, uh, we look at more closely and uh, try to, uh, to build on. Uh, that particular initiative, which didn't, uh, didn't make it into enactment. But I think the science emphasis plus uh, the issue of looking at and, and applying it to specific reauthorization with regards to BLM, then I think the, the policies that follow, whether they're in grazing or timber production, would be uh, uh, most appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I joined in welcoming you, Mr. Secretary. There are a number of things that uh, you'll hear about today, uh, some of which I hope to visit with you about at a later time, including uh, water out west and mining and grazing fees, and drilling, uh, oil drilling uh, near uh, wilderness areas or in areas that may be proposed for wilderness. But for now, let me uh, consign myself to one issue. Uh, we're told, Mr. Secretary, that there is in the world one remaining intact geothermal basin, only one, Yellowstone. All of the others, we're informed, have either been, their, their geothermal features have either been drilled into by directly piercing the basin or drilled into from the outside of the basin. But in every instance, the geothermal basin was either destroyed or seriously denigrated. There is one left, Yellowstone. There is, while we speak this morning, Mr. Secretary, a genuine, real threat to Yellowstone from drilling that is occurring just north of Yellowstone in my state of Montana. Permits for drilling have been asked for in the adjoining state by our friends over in Idaho. This committee in the last Congress overwhelmingly passed legislation which I introduced which would have had the effect of halting all hot water drilling near Yellowstone. It passed the House overwhelmingly after leaving this committee, but unfortunately Events and time caught it in the Senate, and we were unable to get it to the President's desk. Since that time, Ms. Secretary, uh, the state of Montana, the uh, uh, governor in the state of Montana, unfortunately has, uh, has allowed another, yet another well to be drilled just north of Yellowstone into the uh, hot water geothermal underpinnings. It is up to the various states to uh, 
under current law, unless we can do something here, it's up to those various states to simply seal the area around Yellowstone against any further geothermal drilling. But at least uh, one of the governors, unfortunately mine, in fact our past two governors in Montana, have not seen fit to act on our request to seal the basin north of Yellowstone. And so the, uh, the first national park in America and the only intact geothermal basin on earth is this morning continuing in jeopardy and I ask you to place, if you haven't already done so, Mr. Secretary, your attention and the attention of your office on this matter. Finally, Mr. Secretary, there was division and disagreement within your department in the prior administration. The National Park Service fairly well reflected the uh, matter as I've just presented it to you, and that is, in their op opinion, Yellowstone is in serious jeopardy. The United States Geological Survey found that uh, while the park could be in jeopardy with uh, much significant increased drilling, it is not in jeopardy today. Uh, so your Park Service and the USGS disagree. Unfortunately, former Secretary of Interior and the for former head of the National Park Service at his direction both came down on what I believe is on the side of error, which would allow drilling to go forward. So that combined with uh, governors who aren't acting dramatically enough, uh, I think jeopardizes America's great and first national park, Yellowstone. And again, I hope to have your attention uh, firmly on it. Mr. Congressman, you have it. I support the position of the Park Service. Uh, I strongly support your legislation, period. Uh, the reason for that is simply this. Uh, I'm familiar with the USGS study, uh, but when you look at what's at risk and what's to be gained, it seems to me that our responsibility is to weigh in on the side of saying any uncertainty in this case is too much uncertainty. Uh, furthermore, uh, it's my view that when a national park is set aside from public lands, uh, uh, like Yellowstone, that there's an implicit reservation of the water rights that are necessary for the purpose of that park. And I've just got to tell you uh, that central to the creation of that park uh, was the geothermal and geyser system. And I believe that uh, carries with it the implicit direction of this Congress to me to take the steps necessary to assert the federal interest, uh, whether that be in the courts, uh, whether it be uh, in support of your legislation. Uh, so with all deference to the USGS, uh, I believe in the quality of their science, uh, I reach a different judgment. Uh, the risk is too great uh, in this case uh, to allow that drilling to go forward if we can possibly uh, uh, close the basin uh, until such time as we can say absolutely with 100 percent certainty uh, that there is no risk. Well, that's unequivocal, Mr. Secretary, and uh, we are very appreciative of having your authority on our side. Thank you very much. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. I'm pleased to have a Westerner in this position, and I know that we share some of our concerns about public land states. I'm going to do it a little differently. I do have several questions, and I certainly don't expect detailed answers, but I would like a response. For example, you mentioned, and I'm pleased that you did, the, the idea of trading or exchanging some lands. What would you think we could do to increase the possibility of a no net gain thing, a trading and blocking up? Uh, we talk about that a great deal, but there are obstacles to that, like the uh, cultural re uh, reviews and so on. What, what could we do to actually when we acquire needed federal lands, and there are those occasions, why can't we, why can't we exchange or trade or indeed sell? Uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, I believe that the exchange vehicle uh, has not been adequately utilized for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, back in the early 1980s, uh, the department decentralized authority to, I think, an unwise extreme. Now, in most cases, land exchanges 
uh, will involve the, the BLM land base because that's uh, uh, where most of the public domain land is. Yes. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the department in the 1980s spun off that function to the state BLM managers with no departmental review at all. What happened in that process was some very good trades uh, and also some abuses. And is so often the case, uh, perhaps properly so, uh, this committee and others focused on uh, some genuine abuses, uh, which uh, I believe were the product of the lack of, uh, of review at the, at the departmental level. <coughs> and it seems to me that my task now is to see if I can maintain the spontaneity uh, of the process subject to adequate appraisals and to departmental review. Now, this committee has passed legislation uh, suggesting that kind of balance. My understanding is the regulations have not been implemented, and my first uh, goal here will be to see if we can get out some regulations implementing the legislation, which will say to state managers, uh, we favor the use of land exchanges to get rid of inholdings, to block up holdings as appropriate for management, to make additions uh, to the national park system, uh, to set aside BLM conservation uh, areas like uh, uh, the San Pedro uh, conservation area. We encourage those initiatives. Uh, we will review and control them at the national level to make sure that the trades meet priority needs uh, of the department, the National Park Service and the public land system, uh, that the appraisals are adequate uh, and that the trades are thereby a reflection of congressionally mandated policy and there are no abuses taking place. Thank you. I appreciate it. A couple other quick ones. When you mentioned um, ecosystems and, and jurisdictional problems, it sounds a little like buffer zones and so on. Are you concerned about taking and restricting the use of private land and resulting in taking of private properties? Well, I wasn't really, in, in talking about crossing jurisdictional lines, talking about buffer zones, uh, really. What, what, what I'm saying, and kind of going back to uh, some of the other questions is that if we're going to do a good job of managing public lands and avoiding the crises posed by repeated 11th hour listings, we're going to have to manage the Endangered Species Act proactively by anticipating the problem while we still have flexibility to management, to manage the problem without impacting private land rights. If we do this in the right way, it ought to be possible to devise habitat conservation plans and recovery plans and management alternatives that impact principally the public land base rather than freezing, uh, impacting, or otherwise affecting private land rights. Now, in my judgment, the only way we can do this is to make a much more sophisticated effort to gather information, to do the biological studies, uh, to do what's known in the trade as gap analysis. It's a process of looking at all the information in the ecosystem to see where the indicator species are, whether or not they're in trouble, and analyze the kinds of changes that can be made. Those kinds of analyses can't be done by the National Park System for the National Park System by the BLM for BLM lands, by Fish and Wildlife Service for Fish and Wildlife lands, by Reclamation for Reclamation lands, because they are ecosystem issues which transcend those lines on the map. And the issue that we are now studying and that I will surely bring back to this committee is how it is we can do the necessary surveys, research, data gathering, on a system-wide basis to spot the problems, to find the hot spots, and to manage them to avoid unnecessary impacts on private land, as well as to solve the problem. 
Thank you. Just one, one final. In the process, which I understand the administration will likely come forward with a, 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 an energy tax of some kind, possibly, and be a, a BTU tax. Have, have you had input into how that would impact and affect the production of coal on, in public lands and public land states? Uh, the, the issues uh, that relate to an energy type tax have been extensively discussed. It is one area where I can assure you that everyone who is potentially affected, whether it be a BTU tax, a carbon tax, a energy tax, uh, whatever, uh, I, I think I can assure you that the issues have been uh, uh, thoroughly discussed. Thank you very much. <laughs> let, let, the chair, let, let the chair just say that uh, that the Secretary is fully prepared in the purpose of this hearing to, to answer questions, as he just demonstrated. He is here to respond. What I wasn't going to make the Secretary sit through was two hours of opening statements and then two hours of question. You get your choice. You can make an opening statement or you can ask the Secretary questions. The Secretary came here explicitly to, to answer questions, but the members certainly should feel free to, uh, uh, to, to ask questions uh, or to inform the Secretary of concerns they have on various topics. That's the purpose of this, uh, of this hearing. We just weren't going to go through the old ritual where everybody here had to sit around for several hours while we uh, engaged in opening statements and then asked for, to, for a second bid. To the extent that the Secretary will have time, uh, if members are still interested, we will have a, a second round of, of, uh, of questioning for, uh, for members. Mr. DeLugo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I hope to get all everything in in the first round. You've got five minutes. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, uh, certainly uh, want to associate myself with the uh, statement of the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Uh, I think the President has uh, certainly made the right choice here in our Secretary. And uh, we in the territories uh, have uh, high hopes for his uh, personal attention. And uh, let me say that uh, in your prepared statement, Mr. Secretary, I was uh, encouraged by uh, your statement which uh, says, quote, I'm committed to being personally involved in addressing the challenges of the territories. Uh, many of them require an interagency approach. I want Interior to play a lead role in coordinating all agencies involved. Uh, my staff uh, prepared some questions here, which I'm not going to ask, but I, I, I will uh, make reference to them. Uh, they, uh, at, they wanted me to ask uh, about the President's program, his tax program, saying that there's a, a possibility that there will be a change in the tax incentive for investment in the insular areas and what role did the Interior Department play in that. Also, what role did the Interior Department play in the development of the, uh, the health program that's presently underway because of the, you know, the uh, inadequate way that the territories are treated under uh, Medicaid? Well, you and I know that at the present time this is not uh, on Interior's agenda. And uh, for that purpose, I have uh, drafted and introduced legislation which I hope that you will work with me on to make it possible for the Secretary uh, to take the lead role in, in uh, uh, representing the uh, territory's interest before the insular areas. And uh, I hope to have hearings on that very shortly. Mr. Secretary, I want to move to another item, something that is of great concern to my district. And it's something that we, in this committee, spent many, many uh, months on. And this is Water Island. This is a five-acre island sitting in the harbor of St. Thomas. We in the insula areas are very sensitive when it comes to land because there is so little of it if you live on an island. This is a federally owned island that was supposed to have been turned over to the Virgin Islands at the time that the submarine bases and the other federal land was turned over back in the 50s and 60s, but was not uh, because of a contract that had been entered into. Uh, the lease on Water Island ended at the, in December of last year. And uh, yeah. at the time that the lease was winding up, both the House Committee and the Senate Committee were working closely with Interior, saying that we want you to 
make it possible for those who built homes to get title to their land, but not to sell land that is unimproved. We wanted to retain as much of the unimproved land as possible for public purposes. In the 11th hour, we learned that Interior was taking another course, offering all of the land, both unimproved and improved, for sale at a very attractive price, offering federal financing for it, and uh, a letter was written by this chairman of the subcommittee and uh, the chairman on the Senate side asking the secretary not to move forward. Accordingly, we urge that no contracts be signed and all negotiations cease with respect to the sale of such undeveloped property. This letter was written on January 13th, two days before the end of the Bush administration contracts were entered into. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I wrote a letter to you on January 27th asking that the Department take no further action on the sales until you've had a chance to completely review this policy. Is it your plan, Mr. Secretary, to uh, review the matter regarding Water Island? Uh, Mr. Delegate, it certainly is. I'm not sure uh, whether, you know, there is much left to review. That is, it, it may in fact be that the uh, process of spinning that land off uh, was effectively accomplished. Uh, it is my intent to hold the status quo, whatever that is, uh, and to make a thorough review. I would like to thank you for being here this morning. There are several things that I could ask you about, but uh, uh, I'll try to be very brief and, and just mention just one or two. Uh, uh, first of all, we imported some $50 billion worth of oil into this country last year and are continuing to uh, do that. Uh, uh, that causes a tremendous problems, problem in our balance of payments. If we were producing that oil domestically, it would create several million jobs, and not fast food jobs, but oil industry jobs. President Clinton has said he wants to, <coughs> to create new jobs. What uh, <coughs> I'm wondering about, sir, I know that you're going to try to encourage uh, conservation, but even the most politically liberal among us seem unwilling to give up their cars, and we apparently will continue for many years to come to need a tremendous amount of oil. And what I'm wondering about, will you, or I would hope that you would at least give consideration to some development of new sources of oil for this country domestically. Specifically, I would like to see you give consideration to uh, some environmentally safe uh, drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I am told that of the 19 million acres in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, if we could explore or drill for oil in less than 1% of that 19 million acres, that there is a tremendous amount of oil there. And I think it would help our country. 19 million acres is a lot of acres. I have the bulk of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in my district, which is the most heavily visited national park in the country. And the, its total acreage is, I think, 565,000 acres. So that's something I would like to see you give consideration to to help our economy and help the poor and working people of this country. Secondly, Mrs. Vukanovic uh, mentioned a few minutes ago that her state was 87 percent federally owned. The Grace Commission just a few years ago recommended are determined that this country could raise hundreds of millions of dollars and perhaps even billions of dollars by selling uh, a substantial portion of our public lands. And we're not talking about our national parks here now. You mentioned a few minutes ago that the national parks have a six billion dollar backlog in needed repairs and maintenance. Would you be willing to give consideration to selling some of our public lands and putting them on the tax rolls and in private hands and using those funds to, to uh, help defray the cost uh, to uh, repair and bring up to uh, uh, standards uh, uh, some of our national parks? Mr. Congressman, the answer is no. Uh, I don't think there's public support for doing that. 
Uh, I think it would be ill-advised. I think it is contrary to the uh, will of this Congress uh, expressed in the uh, National Land Use Policy Management Act, and I personally uh, have never supported it uh, during my time as Governor of Arizona, and I don't intend to uh, during my tenure as uh, Secretary of the Interior. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> 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 and then on the other hand, and it's refreshing, it's refreshing not to hear it. Let me, uh, let me take a little different tack than my colleague and say that for those of us on the East Coast, and if I do have one problem with this continuous ray of Western uh, Secretaries of the Interior, and I'm sure I won't have any substantive pro problems with you, sir, but uh, those of us on the East Coast always feel a little bit neglected, and we don't mind paying the taxes to fund a lot of these programs, but we don't want to be entirely forgotten. So put me in Mr. Ray Hall's camp of one inviting you to my state for a little uh, exposure to eastern Indians and uh, eastern land issues and uh, what have you. Uh, but to say that for those of us in the east, a lot of our colleagues uh, always talk about wanting to run this country as a business, and then they come forward with proposals uh, that would have us uh, handle it as if it was a liquidation sale. Now, we've got some financial troubles in this country, but I would hope, and I'm confident from your answers, that as Secretary of the Interior, you're not going to take future generations' resources and liquidate them for a short buck and a fast buck and leave us in a situation where we've sold off uh, things that ought to be here for future generations. Um, I'm confident and hopeful that as Secretary, uh, we'll have a serious commitment to Indians in this country. I haven't had time to be on many reservations. But I was out on the uh, Ogallala Sioux Reservation. I thought I was back in the 1930s. We were building uh, homes without, uh, without uh, running water, without septic systems. It was a disgrace for this country, and we've got to change that. Things, uh, maybe some of the economic and infrastructure proposals you talked about, investing in the reservations, programs like OPIC to help investment move in there, I think, are critical. Uh, I think the other thing is that we need to look at the Park Service and heritage corridors, which I'm going to spend a couple seconds on in a second, to look at it as an economic resource. Um, a big part of the campaign was jobs. Uh, this is a jobs issue. This is an attractive destination for the rest of the world to come visit. And uh, it helps the economy when foreigners come here and visit our national parks and our state parks and spend their dollars here. Uh, in the east, we don't have hundreds of thousands of acres, uh, even the small 500,000 acre patch Mr. Duncan has. In, uh, in the east, uh, we were developed earlier. We don't have a lot of open space. But the concept of uh, heritage corridors can make a big difference to us. And I know that the, the department is now looking at uh, coming up with some proposals on it. Uh, I think it's a great place for state, local, and federal partnerships. In my district, when we started talking about the heritage corridor, uh, the people came forward. And these are people that aren't going to get to Alaska and Yellowstone, but want to preserve some of our own natural uh, beauty. We have a real opportunity. Uh, Connecticut's a state that ranks 50th, frankly, in federal lands. And we know we're not going to change that significantly. But the corridor, provide, corridor concept provides the kind of flexibility uh, that can help us all. So I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, I think that uh, the good common sense you exhibited in, in your previous uh, public service will be carried on. I like your directness. Uh, I think that what we need to do is tackle these issues head on uh, to give people a sense that the Interior Department is fighting for the people of this country, uh, Indians and, and those of us that came later, and not simply people that want to have, and I still can't figure out how this works, but, you know, below cost sales of timber and minerals where the federal government is paying extra money so somebody will take our resources away. Uh, you know, if for those people who keep talking about running it like a business, it certainly doesn't make a lot of sense. Help us in the East. Don't forget us, and it's great that you're here. Mr. Abercrombie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Aloha, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the uh, people of Hawaii, of course, want to say, Como mai, come and visit us. Uh, we would be delighted to have you come and see, uh, for example, the great job that the Park Service has done in Hawaii. I'm sure, Mr. Uh, Secretary, you hear quite often uh, and have heard already this morning complaints about your department. I want to be someone who is bringing you some good news 
about what uh, the Interior Department has been doing. You have among the most uh, dedicated professionals in government service uh, in any department uh, in the National Park Service. Our Volcanoes uh, National Park uh, uh, over uh, at the City of Refuge uh, on the Big Island. Uh, some people think uh, that uh, we have uh, national parks on Oahu itself, uh, where Hon Honolulu is. We have no national park there in the largest island where the most population is, and I would hope that at some point in the future you'll have an opportunity to look at a proposal uh, that we have there to, to um, preserve the most fragile coastline, one of the most beautiful coastlines in the entire world. Um, and we hope you'll have a chance to come and visit us and, and see that. You have as well, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, and you have mentioned it and others have mentioned it today, although it was not a, a, a particular emphasis in, in your remarks, the question of tourism. That is most assuredly, I'm sure you agree, a double-edged sword. Uh, where the national park system is concerned, where preservation is concerned, where, where our historical legacy is concerned, for which the department might have responsibility. Obviously, we want as many people as possible to see and understand and review and, and comprehend uh, our history and, and uh, what uh, advantages we have in our natural resources for which you might have responsibility. But in turn, then, we have to, to be concerned about how that is preserved, or how we handle it, so that there is not abuse of the, uh, of the land, of, of the monuments, uh, of the legacy that we have. But I think we have some experience in Hawaii in that regard with respect to preserving the environment and at the same time making a welcome place uh, for visitors. I think that it is also uh, uh, commendable, and I know that you're uh, 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 concerned about the question of, of infrastructure, getting people to and from our uh, national heritage. Uh, for which you might have responsibility is part uh, not only of the job stimulus program as I understand the president to be offering uh, but something that can have permanent value as we go into the 21st century. One of the difficulties and having said that and uh, uh, I hope uh, putting a positive feeling uh, for Hawaii and on behalf of, of the people of Hawaii in your mind and consciousness of the issues that you face. I do have, as Mr. DeLugo uh, had to bring to your attention, uh, a very unfortunate situation. Uh, I have written you a letter. I'm sure you've received uh, an enormous amount of communication just to uh, uh, familiarize you with it or re-familiarize you with it. I wrote a letter to you uh, on the 4th of February with respect to an opinion given by the solicitor uh, of the United States with respect to the trust relationship of Native Hawaiians. You, you need not uh, expostulate upon that today, uh, but I do want to bring to your attention that I can consider it an, an egregious and outrageous uh, betrayal of uh, the Native Hawaiians uh, uh, to say that there is no trust relationship uh, between the United States and the people who were overthrown 100 years ago uh, this January. A sovereign nation was overthrown with the help of the United States military. Uh, a, 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 a renegade republic was set up and then, of course, Hawaii was annexed to the United States uh, uh, subsequently to become a territory. We are, in fact, as you know, Mr. Secretary, the last state in the Union, only 33 years old. Uh, we do have, as I indicated, a rainbow of people who have served this nation uh, well. Uh, who has a native population and part Hawaiian population fully deserving of the recognition of a trust relationship uh, that has been well established over the past 100 years. I hope that you will have an opportunity to review that opinion and to utilize your good offices and such powers you have at your command uh, to reverse that decision. To the degree there might be some question about it, I, I certainly am available. Uh, our delegation is available. and. Uh, let me conclude then by reiterating uh, our hope and that you, you'll have an opportunity to come and see us in person, see the good job that's being done out there and the job that could be done. I hope in turn, uh, uh, or by extension rather, in conclusion, Mr. Uh, Secretary, that your uh, 
emphasis on what used to be Insular Affairs section of our previously named committee. Um, uh, your emphasis on it uh, will continue. Uh, the people of the islands, our island caucus, if you will, on both coasts and both oceans, um, are dependent upon your leadership, are willing to work with you, anxious and looking forward to working with you and cooperating in every way to see to it that all of the people of our great nation and territories are able to contribute to the, the job that I know the Interior Department wants to do under your leadership. Mahalo, thank you very much. Congressman, I accept the invitation. Uh, and will be on your shores in due course. Um, I am familiar with the two opinions. They were uh, midnight opinions, uh, one uh, applying to the uh, status of the native peoples of Hawaii, a second one uh, equally uh, contentious uh, applying to the native peoples of Alaska. Uh, it's not clear to me why the Interior Department, uh, after 12 years in which to uh, reflect upon these issues, felt it necessary uh, to put those opinions in the mail as they were turning the lights out. Uh, they do raise some uh, very contentious problems. I'm aware of the anger in the uh, Hawaii delegation uh, over those issues and uh, would simply say we'll, we'll try to deal with them uh, thoughtfully and as, as responsibly and carefully as we can. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And likewise, as so many of these other members have done, I'd like to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to be here. I'm from Colorado, uh, upstate, uh, up, upstream from many of the representatives here on this, um, this panel today. And I just would encourage you to allow me to give some input on many of the issues that you'll be uh, having to deal with in your department. You did make some general comments on biodiversity and a systematic approach to our ecological systems. And I'm looking forward to see how you're going to further define those. Uh, we didn't hear too many details today as far as specific goals, how, when, where, and why, and how those would apply to private property rights and water and how you're going to manage public lands. I would hope that um, you would not take a position of uh, no risk decision-making, uh, which uh, you used in one of your responses here earlier, and in some cases maybe that's appropriate, maybe in that particular instance, but I hope that wouldn't be a, a general policy. I also have Rocky Mountain National Park in my district, at least part of it, and the manager of that park uh, has been making a lot of public statements in the paper locally about how important it is that we concentrate more on the maintenance and operation of our parks and not the acquisition of more parkland. It's amazing how more outspoken one becomes after you retire <laughs> from the park system. And he has identified that as a major, major problem in the national parks, not being able to stand up to the maintenance and the operation requirements. So I would hope that you would look at that very closely because I think he's right. I think that we have been acquiring more parkland without a clear plan of how we're going to pay for that continued in operation, operational cost that's going to come with that acquisition. Uh, I would again just thank you for, for being here and would look forward to an opportunity to working with you. Congressman, there are an extraordinary range of issues in Colorado, and let me just say uh, that I'm available anytime, anywhere, and we'll arm wrestle all of these issues until we uh, we'll work them out as best we can. Uh, I, uh, I'm not anything if not open and available. Thank you. Unfortunately, uh, very often we uh, we find that the people become more uh, more candid after they uh, after they do retire from service. Uh, and uh, we would hope that would not be the case, but uh, these well, things... Chairman, I, I do admit that I have become 2% more candid uh, since I've been confirmed. <laughs> I'm more concerned. I'm more concerned about your uh, your uh, the people working for the department because unfortunately many of them have had to live under gag orders, which prevented them from talking to this committee or talking to the public, and uh, in, in explaining what the kinds of pressures and problems that they encounter out there in the field on the line. And I think Mr. Allard raises an important point. 
because we know that the park managers and the people involved in, in the day-to-day -day operation of those parks are struggling and, and hopefully the President's address, as you pointed out, will address this backlog of maintenance uh, and, uh, and effort to, to maintain these, uh, these parks and, and we will be able to get uh, uh, the straight uh, information from those individuals who work in those parks on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. That unfortunately has not been uh, the case in the, uh, in the past. Mr. Fallium Vega. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I too would like to offer my personal welcome to you, Mr. Secretary, for being here this morning. A couple of observations and questions I would like to share with you, if I may. I am one of those five non-voting delegates whose votes count when it doesn't count, and it doesn't count when it counts. <laughs> Try to figure that out. Um, Mr. Secretary, I noticed on your statement you made reference to the Inspector General's office within the Department of the Interior, and I raised some very serious concerns of the fact that uh, when audits are conducted by the IG from the Inspector General's office, it seems to be running around as a toothless tiger. It offers recommendations, and it never seems to be no point where a final decision is made by those involved with the management of the department. And I would like to share that concern if whether or not uh, part of the management problems we find here, that has been my experience, uh, when the IG conducts audits uh, in whatever given area that they're given responsibility, somehow there seems to be no follow through or no one within a department making a final decision saying this is it, the buck stops here, uh, let's not uh, meddle around with this uh, thing anymore, somebody's got to make a decision. I'm very concerned that somehow maybe the IEG's office is not given sufficient authority or some way uh, of enforcement after conducting audits or finding uh, errors or flaws in whatever happens in a given audit. And I'm speaking specifically of the situation of the territory of American Samoa and the hearings that were held several months ago. And I raised some very serious concerns that uh, uh, when questions were raised with the, those representing the IEG's office, uh, somehow they didn't seem to offer resolutions themselves as to how they could really get to a point within the management uh, hierarchy of the Department of the Interior, then say, yes, uh, this is the person to make the final decision. You do it or the, the consequences will follow. Uh, I would like to express that concern with the current management of the problems that we have there in the operations of the IG's office. Not that the people involved are bad, but somehow or some way, I find it very difficult to get some finality of, of answers or results after the IG completes its, uh, its audit or, uh, or, or study or review or whatever uh, was given to them to, um, to uh, complete. Another concern that I have, Mr. Secretary, as you have alluded to earlier, uh, the problem dealing with Native Americans. In my experience, at least of this member, uh, serving uh, closely and having a close association with the Native American community, I'm sure you agree with me, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the past how many years, we've expended in excess of a billion dollars, more than a billion dollars for the needs of Native Americans coming out of the authorization and the appropriations process, and yet somehow we continue to find that the Native Americans are still not only at the bottom of the barrel, but they are under the bottom of the barrel when it comes to health needs, economics, education, everything that you can imagine, Native Americans come the lowest. And somehow we're expending a lot of money, but somehow something just seems to be missing over the years that this member has served. And I don't know where the money seems to go and not finding any real resultant uh, effects for the improvements and needs of Native Americans. I also want to thank uh, certainly the chairman and the ranking minority, Mr. Young, and the fact that we now have Mr. Bill Richardson, who is now will serve uh, historically as the chairman of the subcommittee that will specifically handle uh, Native American issues and Native Hawaiian issues, and I'm very, very grateful to the chairman for taking this initiative and for the leadership in seeing that we now have a forum where Native American issues can be addressed directly. And I hope sincerely, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, that the assistant secretary that you will select uh, certainly is going to provide more substance, no more runarounds, no more passing the buck. When we raise questions after uh, 12 months of notice or a year, uh, and to come back 
with those associated with needs Native Americans saying they need more time for study or more time for responding or not even responding to answer or questions or issues raised to the needs of Native Americans. And I think that's a very poor record. Um, Mr. Secretary, we've had time and years of commissions and conferences of studies after studies after studies, and somehow we never seem to, to answer without any equivocation, yes, this is going to be the solution to the problems that the Native American people face uh, every year. And I say this also, Mr. Secretary, the same situation for Native Hawaiians as my colleague from the state of Hawaii has alluded to earlier. There are over 200,000 Native Hawaiians living in the state of Hawaii. I don't need to remind you this year is the 100th year of the illegal and unlawful overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom by U.S. Marines acting unlawfully and without any authority from this government did this over 100 years ago. And I think that needs to be rectified. This wrong has to be corrected. And I'm sure that you'll be very sensitive to this issue in the coming weeks and months as it will be brought forth for your uh, information and consideration for the needs of the Native Hawaiians. And one more issue, Mr. Secretary, as the chairman of the subcommittee on insular affairs have stated earlier, uh, Chairman DeLugo, uh, we're going to propose legislation that's going to bring about a very dramatic change of the shift on how the needs of insular areas are going to be handled. I noticed in your statement that you mentioned something about uh, being the lead agency to appoint an interagency council. I'll tell you now, Mr. Secretary, it's an utter failure. We have tried these for how many years? And what happens? These agencies appoint nothing more than desk officers. There were never policy makers in the, on these interagency councils. So I just want to let you know that it's, it's a poor start if we're really serious about making policy changes that will bring about positive results of the needs of the insular areas. Uh, this insular bill that's going to be introduced, it's going to be a very dramatic shift of the fact that there's going to be a White House uh, involvement, direct involvement of an interagency council comprised of policymakers from all the different federal agencies. Uh, it's simply to take as much authority away from what you now have, Mr. Secretary, and I'm curious uh, what your reaction is going to be to that. And uh, I, I think it's only to propose the fact that the current situation has been an utter failure. And perhaps, Mr. Secretary, you might want to address it. I don't know if my time is over already, but uh, I want to commend you, Mr. Secretary. Okay, I over, we'll give the Secretary time to respond. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But Secretary. Uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, I suspect my initial position will be to oppose uh, the proposal that you just laid on me. That is that uh, having been uh, nominated and confirmed, uh, uh, your uh, response to my 30-day stewardship of the territories is to uh, take it all away. Uh, now, <laughs> that's not to say uh, that I'm not prepared to uh, discuss this issue, and, and I most certainly do agree that we must find a legislative reorganization which appropriately coordinates and focuses uh, the response of the executive branch uh, of government. I must tell you, uh, in a spirit of, of candor, uh, that uh, after 30 days in office, I do prefer the Senate proposal. Uh, I'm capable of uh, uh, changing my mind. I'm capable of compromising. I'm capable of uh, listening uh, to uh, the wishes of other federal agencies, and I'm certain uh, that we must uh, and should work uh, uh, something out. Uh, very briefly, with respect to the Native American issues, uh, I applaud the chairman and the committee uh, for establishing the subcommittee under the chairmanship of uh, Congressman Richardson. I think uh, that it's imperative that there be on the House side uh, a, uh, a focus equivalent to the Senate Select Committee, and I think this is indeed uh, a, a very appropriate way to go. Uh, the Indian issues have suffered from bipartisan neglect across the years in the executive branch. There are, I think, uh, some things now underway. The reorganization and self-governance project that has been driven by legislation is conceptually correct, and there has been some progress made. Uh, we need to make a great deal more. Uh, I have uh, worked hard 
on the BIA budget issues and I think have made some substantial progress in getting the water settlement monies out of the baseline budget of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, uh, at least that has been my objective so that we don't kind of uh, pirate the BIA budget uh, by subtracting uh, water settlements, uh, uh, which is a program which has worked, I think, uh, uh, quite well. Uh, I will be back uh, in due course to the Congress on two issues that I think will merit the attention uh, of Congressman Richardson's subcommittee. Uh, one is the much discussed trust fund. Uh, we are reviewing that and I think the, the beginning question is, uh, in my mind, is the Bureau of Indian Affairs the correct place to do trust fund administration? It's not obvious to me that it is and I think we need to have a careful look at that. Uh, the second issue that I think will be back uh, before the committee and uh, in the subcommittee inevitably is uh, the Indian gaming issue. Uh, I have stated publicly uh, my view of the appropriateness of, of Indian gaming. Uh, I have equally, however, expressed my concerns that the regulatory functions be located in the right place in the federal establishment, clearly delineated, uh, with no confusion about jurisdictional issues, and again ask the question, uh, is the Bureau of Indian Affairs the correct place? Uh, uh, is the Indian Gaming Commission a workable model? Uh, I don't know the answers to those questions, but I think they have to be asked, and uh, we need to make, take another cut at that. Uh, finally, with respect to uh, the territories, Mr. Congressman, uh, until such time, as you strip me of the last vestige of jurisdiction, uh, I'm going to be pretty aggressive about uh, fulfilling our responsibilities. I think the major issue right now is the Guam Commonwealth negotiation. I have uh, met with Congressman Underwood, uh, Governor Ada, and others, uh, and we're going to get moving uh, to see if we can uh, find a way to get that wrapped up. Uh, there will be other issues, and until you turn the lights out, uh, I'm going to be there. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to join in welcoming you uh, to the committee today, Mr. Secretary. I'm, I'm excited, I'm enthused about your uh, appointment. Um, the Department of Interior has an enormous impact on my state of South Dakota, from national parks to water development, mining reform issues, grass and timber issues, wildlife habitat, uh, particularly in western South Dakota. It has an enormous impact, and there are a number of, of issues that I could be uh, discussing at some length with you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to invite you to South Dakota uh, as well. I'm as much a booster as, as anyone else in the committee and I can think of uh, places from Mount Rushmore to, uh, uh, to to Wind Cave, to Jewel Cave, to Spearfish Canyon, to the Badlands, all of them places of enormous uh, beauty that I'd like uh, you to see. But, it, but if there were one place that I'd like to have you visit in South Dakota, uh, I have to think that perhaps uh, it would be on the Pine Ridge, or on the Rosebud, or on the Cheyenne River, among the most impoverished areas in the entire United States. Uh, I, I'm pleased with your remarks about uh, management of the BIA and of Native American issues. I, I think that we can make some real progress. Uh, I am concerned that we much more aggressively address the issues of, of education and uh, economic development and job opportunity and, and develop greater self-sufficiency for Native American peoples and greater opportunities and choices for Native American peoples than the continuing level of poverty and dependency in the federal government that we currently have. And I'm looking forward to uh, uh, greater discussion about the management of the uh, Indian Trust Funds or the mismanagement of the $1.7 billion of Indian Trust Funds but, but today, let me ask you just a couple uh, more narrow questions uh, dealing with the Department of Interior and your Native American responsibilities. One is, uh, there's a great deal of concern in Indian country, and certainly on my part, about your nominee for uh, to the, the uh, head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and I'm curious to know what criteria you are using and what time frame you see for designating a nominee to head the BIA. And secondly, a matter of 
enormous concern to me is the fiscal 94 BIA budget. Who has prepared that budget? Uh, is it the present Assistant Secretary, a holdover from the previous administration, or are you and the new administration, in fact, uh, putting together uh, this budget and the priorities contained uh, therein? Uh, Mr. Johnson, um, with respect to uh, the uh, issue of who will lead the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, I've taken my guidance from the uh, joint reorganization document that has been prepared in consultation uh, with the tribes in this interactive process mandated by legislation. That document makes a very interesting and I think absolutely correct distinction. It says, remember, there are two positions in the hierarchy of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The first one, the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, and then uh, beneath that person, the Commissioner. The document draws a sharp distinction. It says the Assistant Secretary should be responsible for policy, uh, should be in charge of congressional relations, be on the Hill, working the budget, uh, handling uh, the uh, interagency issues, that kind of thing, while the Commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs should be managing on a day-to-day -day basis, day -day basis the bureaucracy and trying to really get it up to par. Uh, I have interviewed and am continuing to interview uh, a wide variety of applicants uh, for these positions. I have not made a recommendation to the President uh, uh, for two reasons. One, I want to be especially sensitive to the process requirements out in Indian country. And I simply have not finished uh, the process of consulting. Uh, that will be underway again next week uh, in structured meetings with various uh, Native American groups, with leaders. And uh, I want to make certain that I've heard from everyone. Secondly, I tend to see the two positions as requiring uh, a simultaneous recommendation to the President of a team that matches that description I just made. Now, with respect to the budget, who proposed it? I did. Uh, the budget that the President will uh, uh, make public in due course uh, is a remarkable document. Uh, I to be especially sensitive to the process requirements out in Indian country, and I simply have not finished uh, the process of consulting. Uh, that will be underway again next week uh, in structured meetings with various uh, Native American groups, with leaders, and uh, I want to make certain that I've heard from everyone. Secondly, I tend to see the two positions as requiring uh, a simultaneous recommendation to the President of a team that matches that description I just made. Now, with respect to the budget, who proposed it? I did. Uh, the budget that the President will uh, uh, make public in due course uh, is a remarkable document. Uh, I suspect it's the first time in the history of this nation that a President, a new President, has taken office and in 30 days presented uh, what is really a, a grounds-up brand new block by block uh, budget. It's a testimonial uh, to his determination uh, to deal seriously and thoughtfully uh, with the fiscal uh, issues, with the budget crisis that faces this country, the need for some, uh, uh, some truth, and a strong and courageous approach to uh, getting the economy. Mr. Secretary, could, could again you apprise us of any kind of time frame for the designation of a commissioner and uh, assistant secretary? Uh, I'm not prepared to uh, do that at this point. I will certainly make my recommendations uh, in the near future, but again, uh, those have to be uh, vetted, and uh, it's the President's prerogative to make those announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I would like to welcome you to my uh, home area, Southern California. Many of the issues uh, that we discussed this morning uh, center around uh, my congressional district, which is Riverside County, California. 
uh, the Endangered Species Act is, uh, is a great concern to us and a great expense. Uh, the Stevens kangaroo rat uh, you may be familiar with is from my area. Uh, we have spent over $25 million locally so far in setting aside habitat for the Stevens kangaroo rat. At the same time, it's, uh, may, it has habitat for the, uh, the potential listing of the, uh, the black-tailed gnatcatcher, which is also of great concern to our area. Right now, um, we're unable to uh, put together a, a reasonable multi-species habitat plan because of the fish and wildlife's position on a species-by-species -species approach toward, uh, toward uh, habitat uh, conservation. I'm hoping that we can work closely together, that we can change that attitude and, and put together a, a workable multi-species habitat conservation plan. And hopefully, since this is a federal mandate, uh, since it is taking many dollars away from us locally, that uh, the federal government uh, would step up and uh, recognize its responsibility under the Endangered Species Act uh, for with some federal assistance. Uh, Congressman, I, I think the multi-species habitat conservation approach is absolutely conceptually correct. Uh, the California state agencies are working on those concepts, as you're well aware, and, and my message to them uh, has been that I, uh, I think it's absolutely conceptually correct, and we'll do everything we can. Uh, there is yet, as you know, another new crisis with the California gnat catcher. Uh, I guess that's in Orange County. Uh, again, illustrating the problems created by letting these listing decisions just drift without becoming proactive. So, so the answer is, I think we're talking on the same track. I, I think, again, we're trying to approach this in Riverside County head on. Uh, we're looking forward to working uh, uh, with your agency to, uh, to, to resolve this issue uh, and other species that are coming up also. Other uh, issue, uh, of course, is the California desert. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm the, uh, one of the congressmen from the south, and so uh, uh, it's certainly a a significant issue from where I'm from, especially in the Mojave section. I don't know if you've had the, the opportunity to, uh, to uh, review this and to go back uh, down to California and to, uh, to uh, talk to the people in the desert and the potential impact that it might have on the area, especially in the mining industry. And uh, we're hopeful that, that any act will take into account the future mining that may take place in the desert, and if it's reasonable and, uh, eth uh, and works uh, within, the, uh, within the environmental rules and regulations that we must live by, that uh, you would have an open mind to, uh, to future mining in the desert. Congressman, I am familiar with the East Mojave proposal. I uh, will be taking a trip in the next two weeks with Senator Feinstein to have an on-the-ground look. Uh, you're invited. Are you Republican or Democrat? Republican. You're still invited. <laughs> uh, uh, seriously, I, I have looked uh, uh, rather carefully into that issue, and I think it really merits a little bit of on-the-ground uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, anyone who is from the California or any other delegation who wants to join me out there, I'd be uh, delighted to argue it on the ground with you. I'll take it up with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, let me extend my warm personal welcome to you today and uh, also uh, extend the greetings and the warm personal welcome of uh, your Democratic predecessor, uh, Governor Cecil Andrus, uh, who held your position uh, a couple of terms ago. Um, I am not only impressed with your intellectual capability, Mr. Secretary, but uh, of your love of natural resources and your understanding of our heritage and uh, and your roots as a Westerner. But what really impresses me is your desire to govern, because, because quite frankly, Mr. Secretary, I think you're head of the cleanup crew uh, of our natural resources in the United States, and I think I can say that with all honesty. I come from, as you know, Idaho, uh, where the federal government owns 64 percent of our state. We are truly a public land state. We could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about issues that confront my great district and, and the state, but let me be quick and, and put some things on the radar screen for you, if I may. 
First of all, um, on February 23rd, I think the uh, Department of Interior will be asked to uh, testify at a hearing on the Birds of Prey Natural Conservation Area, a piece of legislation that I authored and passed through this House um, last year. Senator Craig and I are in total agreement on the language of the bill is now constructed, and I hope that the, the Department of the Interior could support that bill. Furthermore, the lower salmon classification of 112 miles of uh, river, which will complete the longest free-flowing stretch of river in the United States, the Salmon River. We've run into some difficulties in working with uh, eminent domain uh, questions, and I hope that the Department of the Interior would work with the Idaho delegation to see if we can resolve this sticky problem and get this behind us. I've been interested in this issue for many years, and even Senator Church, when he was um, in office, uh, wanted to classify this lower salmon area. We have a very sticky problem with the Mountain Home Air Force Base. We need a, an ecologically sound training range out there to accommodate the new composite wing which is being established in Mountain Home. And uh, the BLM will be very involved in that. And uh, please note that I emphasize an ecologically sound uh, proposal that we need to work on. You had mentioned earlier that you're uh, interested in more uh, national parks. I, I would uh, say that we should not waste a lot of effort in trying to make the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area a national park. I think that would just be wasted time. I have very little enthusiasm for that. And I think that this committee will hold oversight um, hearings on the HCNRA to see how NRAs are working in the United States. Um, at a more informal gathering, you asked me the other day who was going to author the Idaho Wilderness Bill. I said, uh, quite frankly, I was. Uh, we are starting that process, uh, and the whole Idaho delegation is working on that, but we will not involve BLM or Department of Interior lands, but I would assume that uh, you would be consulted, and uh, I would ask for your cooperation on that. You had said earlier in your opening remarks, which I appreciated, that ecosystems approach could avoid the endless species by species approach, Mr. Secretary. And I would like to introduce you to an area uh, in Idaho where past practices have uh, led us to such political conflicts that I think it warrants your personal attention. I'd like to introduce you to Boundary County, Idaho, which is 78% owned by the federal government, where we have critical habitat set aside for the woodland caribou, the grizzly ha bear, and also uh, the Kootenai sturgeon is uh, about ready to be listed on the ESA. The local commissioners up there, because of the lack of coordination and exactly the, uh, the points that you've brought to this committee, have now turned to the Mountain States Legal Foundation to resolve their problems, if you can imagine, to wage war on the federal government in my own backyard in my district. And we need this type of approach that you've articulated today to resolve these issues, not to have the Fish and Wildlife Service come in and declare critical habitat and then have the forest industry say, oh, that's going to cost us 4,000 jobs and, and let that go unanswered. This has raised tremendous conflicts up there and um, a great deal of dysfunctionality within our own citizens. Uh, of Idaho, and I think you can help. Um, also, I don't know if you want to answer this question, but uh, the Department of the Interior has pursued an, an incentive-based grazing fee system, and at some point I would like to know if uh, you're going to pursue that. Um, quite frankly, I don't much like uh, uh, Congressman Sinar's approach. It's a sledgehammer, and, a, and a, we just don't need it out in Idaho. A gradual fee increase with incentive-based uh, um, system for good stewardship would be appreciated. And, and finally, if we're going to have anything, it would be appreciated, Mr. Secretary. And finally, you had said earlier that there was an automatic reserve water right that took effect um, for the Yellowstone Park uh, when that was set aside. Um, if you feel the same way about wilderness, that then it may indicate a wilderness uh, willingness on your part to overturn the previous administration's department solicitor's opinion that water rights would have to be specifically re uh, reserved. Um, that has been a sticky problem for uh, Western states as we've put together wilderness bills. But uh, um, a bit of a statement, a couple of questions, and uh, I just welcome you to this committee. It's refreshing to see you here, and I wish you uh, good luck. Mr. LaRocca, that, uh, that, that's an interesting invitation to answer, uh, to go on the record with respect to all of those questions. Let me just skip across briefly. Uh, with respect to grazing fees, uh, Again, I think if you listen carefully, and if the Western grazing uh, rights holders listen carefully, uh, I have signaled my willingness to discuss this uh, in an incentive-based system and have repeatedly said uh, 
My primary concern is the stewardship condition of the land, and I believe that the linkage uh, between the two uh, bears some <coughs> careful discussion. Uh, with respect to reserve water rights, I would carefully limit uh, my response to uh, Mr. Williams uh, by noting that I was talking about reserved water rights in national parks. I recognize the difficulty uh, of the wilderness designation issue, and I guess I'd prefer to save that for another day. Lastly, uh, I certainly support the Birds of Prey uh, National Conservation Area. Uh, I underline that because I think it's important as we talk about recreation in the United States, we remember that we have not just uh, a national park system, uh, but increasingly uh, the opportunity to designate public lands for recreational use. We've had some, uh, I think, uh, very interesting examples of that coming out of this committee and others in recent years. I think they've been tremendously successful. Uh, the United States Forest Service uh, now administers a national monument uh, at Mount St. Helens. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't invite the United States Forest Service across all these jurisdictional lines into a large role in the stewardship and recreational use of their land. Uh, the same, I think, is especially true of the Bureau of Land Management. And I would refer again uh, to the San Pedro uh, Conservation Area, which is really a spectacular piece of riparian scenery, which 10 years ago was in private hands, uh, faced uh, with the possibility of development, uh, which as a result of the effort of this committee and others, uh, was brought through a land exchange into designated statutory use, primarily for environmental uh, and recreational values. I view the Birds of Prey NCA as another nice example which should cause all of us to reflect on how it is we invite the Bureau of Land Management into this 21st century view of the use of public lands. Uh, and I think they'll respond enthusiastically if we can create an environment in which it's not automatically assumed that every time there's an interesting project uh, that they're the land base out of which an area is carved and given to some other land management agency. Uh, I think many of those concepts uh, apply to the Hell's Canyons issue, too. I don't think it automatically has to follow in all cases that the primary designation of a piece of land uh, for, uh, environment, for, for special environmental care, uh, aesthetic, and recreation values automatically means a Park Service uh, designation. We ought to have a little competition in this business uh, from the other agencies. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Secretary, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fazio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next time I'll try and make the airline do better so I can get here sooner. Um, Mr. Secretary, you've certainly heard a, uh, a lot, and I think what you're hearing is sort of pent up uh, 12 years, uh, although I have only been here six, of uh, frustration, at least on this side of the aisle, with uh, you know, sort of lights on, nobody's home at the top. In fact, I even heard Cy Jamison on the radio the other day saying he shouldn't have invoked the God Squad uh, for those, uh, whatever, he got six timber sales in Oregon, uh, which ultimately led to a uh, extraordinarily broad injunction because he upset the judge so much and destroyed the cooperation and coordination between the two agencies. But uh, Cy's history, uh, thankfully. But that leads me to the next uh, question, which is, uh, when might we expect to have assistant secretaries and a BLM director? Uh, Congressman, I think in the fairly near future. <laughs> uh, uh, That's definitive. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'll, uh, I'll take that home. Uh, if I could, uh, we had the IG uh, in and we had some rather startling testimony uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, some of it was uh, essentially an expanded on earlier testimony. And it showed that an, an investment, uh, for instance, in the case of the BLM, in a few positions, that is, uh, people who are charged with acquiring access to uh, isolated parcels of federal land, the BLM is a checkerboard in Oregon because the ONC lands, uh, 
were uh, terminated, laid off, reassigned by the last administration. And in fact, uh, the IG could document uh, that uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of timber, which was mature, uh, but not old growth, not under the injunctions, not impacting on the spotted owl uh, situation or old growth forests or critical uh, watersheds or fisheries. That is, timber that's eminently harvestable uh, was sitting on the stump because there had been no one working in the agency to acquire the needed access. Uh, that's going to cost money. They went on to document uh, a whole host of issues under traditional practices that have been backlogged on the BLM lands in Oregon, timber stand improvement, uh, uh, fertilization, and, uh, and uh, reforestation. And then, uh, of course, they didn't even get into the, the other investments that go beyond that, fisheries, watersheds, and that. Will there, given our constraints, do you think you can find a place in your budget to make these investments, both that mitigate uh, the environmental economic crisis in the Northwest, and secondly, some of which provide an immediate and dramatic return to the federal government, such as hiring five people to acquire access to harvest uh, several hundred million dollars worth of timber where the federal government gets half of the returns. Congressman, I have uh, looked very carefully at the ONC uh, land maintenance investment reforesting infrastructure, upgrading of roads for recreational access issues uh, in the budget. Uh, the President's budget will uh, be out in short order, and I will leave it to you uh, to judge the quality of my presentation uh, in the budget. But you are aware of the problem, and we can have further discussions. I appreciate I, that. I, I am, and I think it is recognized in the administration that uh, the uh, ultimate resolution of the timber issues in the Northwest are in some measure going to depend upon uh, making uh, a serious commitment to these kinds of issues. I appreciate that. That's a, uh, a dramatic change from uh, past testimony we've had, and I will look forward to working with you on that. Uh, could I ask uh, about something else where I'll probably get a definitive soon, maybe? Uh, would be the Forest uh, Summit, so called. Uh, do we have any? Uh, timeline on an announcement uh, for that, or can we, do we have a timeline on announcing a timeline? <laughs> <laughs> I think the timeline on announcing the timeline uh, is up to the President. Um, th this issue is being uh, discussed very uh, intensely in the administration. It is not a single agency issue, and I uh, am confident that uh, in the foreseeable future, you will uh, see a, uh, a timetable for beginning that process. But I stress that it is not uh, going to be led by the Interior Department or uh, by any one agency. Uh, the President will uh, make those decisions, I think, and uh, stipulate the nature of the process and how it will be led, uh, I think, quite likely uh, uh, from the administration rather than any one agency. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, but one thing you said there I think is key, and that is not uh, a single agency, and, and I'm very cognizant of that. But let me, uh, under your jurisdiction, we have both uh, the Bureau of Land Management and Fish and Wildlife, who we have seen the spectacle in the last uh, uh, two administrations, a uh, ex rather extraordinary spectacle of uh, them suing one another. Uh, can we expect that you will uh, perhaps uh, sit down the uh, heads of uh, these agencies and we can uh, move ahead on a more cooperative manner. I'll give you an example. The Forest Service is working on a plan under a judicial mandate, as I alluded earlier. Uh, the judge uh, put forward a rather broad injunction, and in part it's believed because of uh, Mr. Jameson's uh, God Squad tweaking and uh, of the nose of the judge. But that's water under the bridge. But the Forest Service is looking at developing two plans, one which would be if the BLM coordinates and cooperates with them because a successful recovery plan for the spotted owl and an ecosystem-based approach would require that the two agencies integrate their planning, which they haven't traditionally, and one which would be the Forest Service can go forward on its own with no change in BLM practices, but that means a much, much bigger hit on Forest Service lands. 
Uh, would you encourage the cooperation and coordination of Fish and Wildlife, Forest Service, I know that's beyond your jurisdiction, but at least you have Fish and Wildlife and BLM, and hopefully you can open a dialogue with uh, Secretary Espy and bring the Forest Service into more cooperative uh, arrangement with your agencies. All right. Mr. DeFazio, I had a, I've had occasion already to meet with Secretary Espy to uh, discuss these issues, and I've also uh, met with Dale Robertson, the head of the Forest Service. I uh, was really gratified by the response uh, which uh, coming uh, from my fellow secretary in a new administration was, I think, uh, uh, predictable, but also uh, the response from the Forest Service. Uh, I, I think they were genuinely grateful uh, to contemplate the idea that we would all be working together and that there would be uh, an administration policy that uh, could give direction to uh, the Forest Service, BLM, uh, Fish and Wildlife, EPA, and all of the other agencies. One last question. Uh, or, or the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. McGinnis. That's the end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The state of Colorado, as you know, Colorado, I think, is the only state in the Union where all of our water runs out of the state and we have no water that runs into the state. And it's an arid region. And as you know uh, from your previous comments and certainly from your previous history as the governor of Arizona, that uh, there's a great deal of uh, dissent in regards to whether or not the federal government will make an attempt to uh, acquire water rights within the state water law that's applicable to that state, i.e. the state of Colorado. So my question would be, uh, what is your uh, commitment uh, in regards to that uh, acquisition and more specifically acquisition of uh, water rights for wilderness areas and so on through existing state law? which, as you know, in the state of Colorado is unique as to other states because of our particular water problems. Uh, Congressman, uh, I, I think in summary I would say that uh, this administration, certainly I respect the general primacy of state water law in the West. Uh, it isn't quite that simple because it, it is clearly established in law and I think uh, the federal government has indeed a fiduciary obligation to assert some kinds of overriding federal water rights. For example, uh, I don't think anyone would challenge our obligation to assert the primacy of Indian water rights, uh, the primacy of uh, reserve water rights uh, for units of the national park system, uh, which were established for a purpose that's related to the water. Uh, the example I gave uh, was Yellowstone. There, there are many others. Uh, it seems to me that the specific issue in Colorado right now is the nature of water rights uh, in the upcoming Colorado Forest Wilderness Bill. Uh, my judgment is that all of the parties uh, are quite close, uh, both federal and state parties and uh, members of the Colorado delegation. So uh, my own sense is that this is not going to be, after all these years, of hassling that we are really uh, getting very close to specific agreement in the case of Colorado. And I don't have any uh, uh, hand grenade to toss into that process. I'm quite content with what's going on. Uh, a, a, as I should be, because I would underline the fact that uh, uh, the Forest Wilderness Bill is not even part of my jurisdiction. So you may view my comments as uh, either reassuring or gratuitous or both. And, uh, Mr. and on that point, Mr. Chairman, your cooperation in that regard uh, is appreciated. I know you've put some uh, effort recently into assisting us with that. Let me ask one final question, Mr. Secretary, and that is your position in regards to the Animas La Plata project and coming back to what you said, the primacy of Indian water rights. As you know, that's a project that we've been very committed to in Colorado, and I would like to know what your position uh, is in regards to the continuation of the construction of that project. Uh, I am committed to continuing to try to resolve the issues uh, that stand uh, in the way of the Animus La Plata project. It's been authorized by Congress. Uh, it has been uh, funded at a preliminary uh, level, and uh, I believe you will see uh, a continuing commitment uh, in the Department's budget for the coming year. And is that to say that you're not opposed to the project? I'm uh, not clear on your answer there. I am not opposed to the Animus La Plata project. 
Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I appreciate your showing up today. It's English. I'm really looking forward to some changes, including the seniority system for asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to inform you, this is a dramatic change. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I endorse the position of the junior <laughs> congresswoman from Arizona. I have... Um, first in the seat, first in time. <laughs> I have four, uh, four issues that um, I'd like you to respond to now or, or at some other time, but would just like to get them on the table for discussion. Um, one of them is a serious lack of focus and expertise within BIA for natural resource management, technical assistance, and assisting tribes in formulating environmental policy for both economic development and long-term sustainability. Is there a possibility of beefing up uh, BIA in that area um, so that, that um, our tribal lands have the same potential um, as public lands that are, that are off reservation? The second area, it is I, I do appreciate and know of, and I'm sure you know of my um, um, fondness for the ecosystem approach to natural resources uh, on our public lands. And I would like to encourage you to open up the lines of communication and assert pressure, if possible, on Department of Defense to take a more responsible stewardship of the public lands that they have misused. We are uh, in the process of, of um, um, slowing down the spending in the military areas, and I think that it is only fair that they meet their responsibility of uh, environmental cleanup and protection and resource management uh, that is expressed on the other um, public lands. A third area has to do with the Navajo Hopi land dispute. I again encourage you to appoint someone to facilitate a process that has far-reaching effects to all of us and resolve a 111-year-old dispute uh, that, that appears really to have a small window of opportunity. And I think we need assistance in resolving this, and I think we need it very quickly. The last area has to do with the Central Arizona Project, which is an ongoing, costly, but necessary infrastructure in Arizona. And um, we will, uh, again, need some creative solutions to addressing both the financial and the environmental impact of this project on both the state and the federal government. And I ask for your assistance in all of these areas and probably will have more in very short order. Thanks for being here. Ms. English, uh, answering your last question first, uh, Chairman Miller is watching me intently <laughs> against the possibility of any more orders uh, uh, moving the completion date uh, even further into the future. And uh, dependent upon his, uh, you and I are both dependent upon his goodwill. And I think that means that you and I both must reaffirm to the world that uh, Arizona has a repayment obligation. And whatever the restructuring, uh, that may go on and whatever my administrative role in that. Uh, the bottom line, I'm afraid, is that the era of reclamation projects being restructured in this Congress to waive interest payments, uh, stretch out repayment dates, uh, in effect uh, postpone the obligation are probably gone. Now, if, if the Chairman wants to contradict me, I... Uh, you <laughs> okay. Uh, with respect to the Navajo Hopi dispute, uh, I have recused myself 100% uh, from that issue and will, uh, as soon as uh, my Senate uh, uh, confirmed appointees are on board, uh, delegate my responsibility uh, to uh, one of the Assistant secre Secretaries. Uh, with respect to the ecosystem approach and the role of the Department of, of Defense, uh, the cleanup issues are going to be very tough. Uh, the other set of issues are the Section 7 Endangered Species Consultation issues, which require, the, in my judgment, the Department of Defense to manage its lands by the same 
sensitive standards that BLM or any other land management agency does. Uh, I think they've made a lot of progress under Secretary Cheney uh, from zero compliance to taking it quite seriously. Uh, and I think that uh, under Chairman uh, uh, Secretary Aspen, uh, we can uh, expect uh, uh, that progress to continue. And finally, I will uh, uh, continue to have a careful look at the Natural Resource uh, Administration of the Indian land base because, again, Indian reservations are subject to the same federal laws that govern uh, other lands uh, when it comes to clean water, uh, clean air, and the administration of the Endangered Species Act. Delegate Underwood. Microphone. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Now, Mr. Secretary, initially I'd like to thank you for your uh, uh, generous time that you spent with me personally and people from Guam over the past week or so uh, regarding some issues that we've brought to your attention. And I am very encouraged and I like very much the fact that uh, you have taken the time in your opening statement to uh, make a commitment to being personally involved in addressing the challenges that affect the uh, territories, uh, the insular areas. I would like to make a couple of points and, and by way of making those points also ask a couple of questions. Uh, one is the, uh, as you know, the Inspector General uh, for Department of Interior has broad authority to enter into uh, the government of Guam and audit and make comment upon any activity of the government of Guam as it has in other insular areas. And this is the kind of activity which is seen in the territories as a remnant of a, of a colonial framework, a colonial uh, a mentality, because it would be something that would be uh, consistently resisted in any state or any local jurisdiction. Um, interestingly, as uh, the, the line of argument that is given uh, with respect to that particular power is that uh, the income taxes which are paid on Guam are are labeled federal taxes. And so this gives the line of, uh, of uh, authority to the IG to come into and audit the activities of the government of Guam. Yet curiously when, as you know, per, as you perhaps know, earlier in uh, January when uh, the uh, participation of the delegates uh, was called into question in the Committee of the Whole Vote, uh, these taxes were not seen as federal taxes but were seen as something else. And in the interplay between um, how uh, territories are dealt with and how insular areas and how definitions are constantly made and reshaped and redefined, and it always seems to do so in a way which benefits or which uh, allows uh, the federal government to intrude on the one hand and to keep territorial participation at a minimum on the other. And uh, I, I just want to bring that issue to your attention and hope that at, at some point in time we will visit that issue uh, with the Department of Interior. Uh, it also, uh, the, the way that this issue it will be dealt with, and it was raised earlier by uh, uh, two previous delegates about uh, how in general uh, the issue of um, the territories, issues pertaining to territories will be dealt with. Um, I'm very encouraged and I want to publicly thank you for uh, the fact that uh, you have made a commitment to deal with the Guam Commonwealth issue uh, uh, quickly and, uh, and with, your, with your personal attention with, regardless of the fact of what will happen with the reorganization of how territories and insular areas are dealt with. But I do want to make an additional uh, point in this and that is that one of the marks or one of the benchmarks by which uh, people in the territory certainly uh, view the Department of Interior in terms of their commitment to insular areas and insular issues is the participation of people from the territories in the affairs of the Department of Interior. And I know that uh, we have talked about, uh, you, have, uh, you have steadfastly throughout the morning uh, not made any statement regarding uh, appointments for Assistant Secretary. and uh, and and. I understand, although this of course is all speculation, I understand that, that the appointment that will be made will probably not include somebody from the territory and there, are, there is one uh, slot of Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary and perhaps the other one is going to be uh, eliminated as a result of some uh, 
uh, cost-cutting uh, strategy. But, but there are other positions within the Department of Interior, and I would like to make a, a special case and a special plea that uh, during your administration, during your tenure, that you include uh, uh, people from the territories. There are many qualified individuals out there, talented, well-educated, who would like an opportunity to help you uh, uh, and help your effort to personally attend to the territories. Mr. Congressman, I hear you and I agree with what you're saying and I will attempt to construct a management team uh, along those lines. Good morning. I am uh, pleased to hear that you're coming out to California in the near future and I would uh, like to invite you into the northern part of the state to come into the Central Valley and possibly meet with some of the people that bend my ear from day to day about the issues that concern us. I represent the Delta or a big portion of the Delta in California and the Delta smelt and the Kid Fox and the Swainson Hawk and a number of other endangered species are contained in my district. But as I was sent here to represent the people of my district, I have a great concern for the property rights and water rights <coughs> and the effect of federal actions and legislation on that. What effort will you make to bring into account the social and economic costs of the Endangered Species Act? Mr. Bombo, I believe that the Endangered Species Act requires consideration of those issues and I will certainly follow the law. The other, the other question I had, had dealt with some uh, testimony that we had a couple of weeks ago that I guess it gets into the whole um, no net gain of uh, public property and it dealt with the uh, some nonprofit groups and land trust that would buy land at a, at a low price and turn around and sell it to the federal government at a larger price. Um, how will you work to curtail that as far as the, the Interior Department? Well, I happen to think that the Nature Conservancy and the Trust for Public Lands and other groups have done an extraordinary public service and uh, generally been exemplary in their handling of these issues. I support their efforts and uh, I'll continue to do so. Do you, just so, just so I can follow this, do you believe that, uh, that it would not be better for the the federal government to buy the lands directly if it is in the public interest to uh, acquire those lands? Well, it obviously depends on uh, the circumstances in each case. Uh, I can tell you that uh, during my tenure as uh, governor of Arizona, I frequently encountered situations where uh, the Arizona legislature uh, either did not have the budget space or uh, the particular interest in, in acquiring a parcel of land uh, that the public very much wanted to see preserved and uh, which was slated for development. And again and again and again, uh, these agencies have played a very important intermediary role. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for uh, coming down today. I uh, come from western Kentucky and uh, it's a land where uh, Small farms predominate. Agriculture is our biggest industry out there. Uh, we have grazing, we have row crops, uh, we do a lot of timbering. And uh, I'm particularly concerned, will be concerned uh, going forward with uh, the actions and policies of uh, the department that undercut the economy of uh, the productive agricultural operations of my small farmers. Um, grazing fees, uh, where they are subsidized and, uh, and uh, below the costs that uh, my farmers carry in the way of taxes, in the way of upgrading their uh, grazing lands uh, are something that I'm going to be focusing in on very carefully. Um, irrigation uh, water costs, uh, which undercut the uh, at 
efforts, uh, well, hard worked at efforts of uh, farmers to take care of the water on their lands in a proper way in terms of erosion control and groundwater protection. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the uh, water charges that the department puts forth in a, in a careful way. And uh, timber sales, uh, low cost timber sales, uh, it's come up as a very tough issue for us all to deal with, but the Department of Interior, to the extent that they're engaged in below cost timber sales on BLM lands, are undercutting uh, private producers, not just in my western Kentucky region, but uh, throughout the southeast where small woodlots, privately owned woodlots, predominate. And uh, to the extent that these below cost timber sales in federal areas continue, and have continued for some time, uh, it constitutes a taking, and uh, it's a taking that uh, hurts us and uh, our efforts to do, as has been mentioned today, timber stand improvement, fertilization, and reforestation. And uh, I hope that uh, perhaps we could con consider, the administration might consider moving in an aggressive way on this below-cost uh, timber sale situation by perhaps by executive order raising quickly raising the uh, minimum costs uh, that are charged uh, the last time i looked at this it was one dollar two dollar and five dollars per thousand board feet for uh for a timber depending upon the grade and perhaps we could go to uh, for the time being until this was resolved legislatively uh, a flat fee of uh, twenty dollars a thousand board feet, uh, which is uh, uh, it's a very very low cost, and uh, we could move this forward uh, to some legislative resolution by the executive branch taking uh, taking a forthright approach here. Congressman, it's a very interesting set of observations that are not frequently made in this debate. Perhaps uh, reflecting. Uh, the fact that the Southeast is not uh, heavily represented on this committee. Uh, but you're dead right. Uh, the subsidies uh, to Western resource use uh, are at the expense of other comparable resource producers uh, in other areas of the country. Uh, my sense is that in the 19th century there was probably a valid public uh, rationale for that. The idea was that it was a development subsidy uh, to accelerate the opening of the western frontier. Well, uh, the western frontier is open, uh, and uh, the logic, it seems to me, is, uh, uh, is, is much less uh, shaky. Now, uh, in terms of the administration's view of this, I, in general, uh, I can tell you that Mr. Panetta uh, has been uh, pretty unrelenting in his advice, at least to the Interior Department, that uh, our ability to collect uh, a market return uh, is linked uh, to other considerations in our budget. And uh, I can tell you that I think there is going to be uh, substantial pressure from this administration uh, behind the concept that public resources ought to be sold at, uh, at market value. Thank you very much. Lehman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. It's a real pleasure to have you uh, here today. And let me first of all uh, commend you for a couple items in your statement. First of all, the new attitude of the Department toward uh, protection for the California desert. Uh, I'm confident that now, uh, with your cooperation and with Senator Feinstein in the Senate, we'll be able to solve the remaining issues uh, relatively quickly and, and get a bill for California here that's uh, uh, good for all of us. Uh, and I think the last remaining significant issue is the status of the East Mojave. And I won't get into the details of that today. I think there'll be ample opportunity for us and, and the Senator to, to, uh, to work that out. Also, uh, thank you for your position on the 1872 mining law, uh, which the subcommittee which I chair will hear very soon. Again, I'm confident that uh, we can break the log jam there and get us a bill that uh, will not just pass this House, but pass the Senate and get to the President's desk as well. And we're hoping to do that uh, in very swift fashion. Uh, I'm. Uh, 
I am not going to engage in any lengthy discussion today on the implementation of uh, the Miller-Bradley Bill uh, 429. I am sure you have an opportunity to, uh, to look it over. And there are going to be many key decisions you are going to have to make with respect to implementing that legislation uh, that will have a tremendous impact in California on our economy as well as our environment. Uh, and uh, the only thing I wanted to get clarified right now was I understand it earlier when I unfortunately was not here, you made some statement regarding the, uh, the Delta smelt and possible listing of it. And I'd, I'd just like for my own uh, knowledge to clarify what you said. Congressman, in response to another question, I uh, suggested that the listing of the Delta smelt is all but inevitable. Uh, it is either going to be uh, as a result of a court order uh, or the Department uh, acting uh, in advance of a court order. Uh, that that uh, fact, I think, has been on the table for some time now. Yeah. Well, it was my understanding, and that could be confused and wrong, that is not impossible, but that uh, there was a decision announced a couple of weeks ago that the smelt would not be listed as either threatened or endangered at this time, uh, but rather would be treated as sensitive. Is, is this information going beyond that uh, uh, revelation? Uh, Congressman, my reading of the uh, litigation and the uh, science surrounding this issue is that uh, it is not a question of whether, but a question of when. Okay. Let me uh, uh, very quickly move to uh, a, a, a few other issues. Uh, first of all, I think one of the most important uh, tasks you have uh, is to the deep, what I would call the depolitization of the Park Service. What we have seen over the past 12 years has, uh, uh, I think, been terrible. Almost everybody with any conscience in the Park Service uh, has become a whistleblower. Uh, and at one point during the Reagan administration, that included the director. I mean, coming to us and telling us what's really going on that they can't say in public. Uh, morale there is uh, terrible. I think you've probably found that out by now. And uh, a lot of it has to do with decisions not being on the ba made on the basis of professional judgment and experience, but being made uh, in the context of a, of a political statement or uh, some other agenda coming from somewhere outside the, the Park Service. Uh, I would hope to, that you could move on that. To, as quickly as possible and restore the confidence, not just the public, but of people within the service. As you know, I have uh, uh, Yosemite National Park in my district, as well as uh, Kings Canyon and uh, Sequoia National Parks. With respect to Yosemite, we have uh, many uh, key issues that have been uh, uh, shoved under the rug for the past 12 years. They've been talked about, but nothing has been done. I view this as a historic opportunity to act on those. One of those is transportation in the park, uh, uh, which relates directly to the second issue, which is our pollution problem in the park. As you know, Yosemite is a non-attainment area most of the year, uh, yet we still have diesel buses going in and out of the park, which, and frankly, under the Clean Air Act, are not going to be allowed in San Francisco or L.A., but will be allowed in Yosemite, despite the pollution. Uh, we have uh, the public transportation system in the valley is operated by diesel, despite the problems uh, of congestion and uh, 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 pollution there. We are going to have to move on a transportation plan in Yosemite, not just talk about one if we are going to save the, uh, the, the park. Uh, the final issue regarding Yosemite, and I won't get into the contracts this morning because I know we are going to have a hearing on that and you will have opportunity to, to discuss it then, is the question of, of employee housing which I guess is not just a Yosemite problem, but probably uh, service-wide. But uh, we've, again, it's part of the morale problem. We have inadequate housing for employees. They're being asked, in my opinion, uh, to pay more than the housing's worth. In the long term, it's costing the Federal Government more because of what we're paying for uh, heating bills there in the winter and what the constant uh, uh, repairs cost us. I know it costs money, but uh, every past director we have had of the Park Service, uh, despite what they have had to do publicly, has admitted privately to the mess and asked us to do something despite their public position uh, on the issue. Uh, another issue I would like to mention briefly that uh, you are going to have to deal with is the Wards Valley uh, problem in California with respect to finding a site for us to locate our low-level waste. As you know, we have an agreement with the State of South Carolina that uh, I think expires in 18 months. We don't know whether or not we'll be able to renew it or what the price will be. It's an immensely controversial issue, uh, uh, both for the biotech industry, which uh, desperately needs a place to put this waste, and for, and for environmentalists on the other side who are concerned about uh, what will happen if it goes there. 
Uh, I don't envy you for having to make uh, that decision, uh, but uh, you're going to, and I suspect we're going to have to react to whatever posture uh, you take. And f uh, finally, and I won't ask you to respond to this, but I'll just mention it. Last year, Senator Worth and I worked very hard uh, with the problem of, uh, of, of poaching and the unnecessary loss of wildlife on our public lands. Uh, I would hope you would look at the legislation uh, that uh, we developed last year and work, work uh, to upgrade the a law enforcement mechanism within the Fish and Wildlife Service, which has been uh, terribly decimated, woefully inadequate at the present time. And uh, we have a very severe problem in this country with trading in animal parts. Uh, we're destroying the bear in the Sierra right now and many other species. It's well documented. And uh, in, in addition uh, to the states being involved in it, I think uh, at the highest levels, the uh, secretary is going to have to be involved in seeing that. Uh, we don't just save the ha this habitat out there that we're protecting for poachers, but uh, that we save it for the wildlife as well. Thank you. Mr. Dickey. Mr. Secretary, I represent the 4th District in Arkansas, and I want to make sure that we're on the same level. Do you recognize, or have you had time enough to recognize that that's the finest and most important? It has the finest and most important state park in America, the Hot Springs National Park. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we have a circumstance there that is, is pretty unique, I think, in that the National Park, of course, protects the hot springs. But we have a flooding problem. And I, the floods come in at periodic times, and there's something like eight feet, six feet, all the way across the the downtown of our of our park. I wonder if you could tell us, assuming this project of somehow alleviate, alleviating the um, the flooding, assuming it is justified, where will the funds come from? So, Dickey, I, I can't answer that question. You know, in light of my current knowledge, except to say that uh, they'll come out of the federal budget. And they will be, you know, one more example of a long list of, uh, uh, of demands that are being made on the system. Now, uh, whether they come from uh, the Department of Interior or the Corps of Engineers, obviously I would uh, be very interested in uh, persuading you and the Corps of Engineers that that's really uh, more appropriately uh, their responsibility. Are you familiar with that problem yet? Not in detail, no, sir. Okay. Now, the Washita National Forest also is part of the 4th District, or a small part of it, and cutting of timber is a, is a big, big industry for all of us in, uh, in our southern part of Arkansas. Is there, can you tell me what the guidelines you think there should, we should follow in cutting the timber just generally? Uh, I can generally, bearing in mind that uh, this is Mr. Espy's jurisdiction rather than mine, but uh, I certainly have an opinion, nonetheless. Uh, Let me get that straight. The Washita National Forest is yours, isn't it? No, sir. Uh, it, it's part of the Department of Agriculture. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, I'd be happy to volunteer an opinion. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we better talk about this privately. You <laughs> <laughs> may not like that opinion. <laughs> um, the, uh, what, what we need to do with the public forests of this country is moved toward a sustainable level of timber harvest. Now, we got badly off track in most of the national forests of this country with mandated increases in timber cuts during the 1980s. Uh, that's very clearly what has created the problem in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the, the demands coming from the political leaders in Washington, the setting of quotas mandating increased production led to accelerated clear-cutting uh, and the uh, collapse of the ecosystem. Uh, endangered species uh, appearing everywhere. Now, there's a lot of good forestry knowledge in this country, and it seems clear to me that, the, that we can use the great majority of our forest base for sustainable levels of timber cutting. Uh, wh what I can't tell you is whether or not there's a specific problem uh, in the Washington National Forest. My, uh, uh, if there is, I haven't heard about it. All right, one last question. We have uh, also in the district is the Crater of Diamonds. It's in Murfreesboro. 
Are you familiar with the controversy that's going on now about that? No, sir, I am not. I thought you got to pay 50 cents and dig for diamonds. Well, I, think, I think they're digging a little deeper and they're having tests now, but I wonder uh, what the, the issue is that they, whether or not we have mining. Of the, this is the only source in America uh, for, for diamonds, and, and I've met with some people recently, and their position in the district is that we ought to let people do the mining and pick up and dig from the, from the surface. Uh, explain to me what conversion means in your mind, and then that, that, that's what may be being brought to you, or the process may be coming that way. Well, conversion to me means theft. <laughs> oh, I guess, not, I guess that's the lawyer version, uh, the lawyer meaning of the word. The, sir, I'm not familiar with the specific issue. First of all, I, I thought the diamond uh, thing was a state park rather than a federal park. See, that's where the conversion comes in, is it to be converted from a, a, from a state park to a national park upon your decision. Hey, is this park in your district? Yes, sir. Uh, wh what is your preference? Well, I'm not sure yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ms. Congress, let, let me just say I, this. I there are only told. two people whose opinions yeah. I care about on this issue. And that's you and the President of the United States. Well, of course, he's from Hot Spring. <laughs> <laughs> and that's close by. I'm glad to hear that on two respects. <laughs> Thank you for your time. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Vento. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, Governor uh, Babbitt, I'm pleased to hear you uh, uh, articulate the concerns. I thought that maybe we could reinstitute the Harold Ickes proposal for reorganization of the Natural Resources uh, <laughs> Agency of the uh, federal government. Uh, <laughs> took him, it, he tried mightily, and uh, as you recall from, uh, uh, from some of his uh, biographies, he wasn't successful. But in any case, I do appreciate your sensitivity and responsiveness to members because very often as we're dealing with these problems they don't uh, they don't uh, follow the lines as you've indicated we got to get a better uh, knowledge and database uh, uh, along those uh, uh, lines uh, mr. secretary you uh, in responding to the um, conservation uh, of lands you articulated concerns about uh, uh, conservation areas and NRAs within the Forest Service. I might say that the reports we've got back indicate that the Forest Service doesn't often treat those uh, lands that we have congressionally designated much different uh, than yeah, other forest lands. Land. That's a sad uh, reality of the past uh, uh, decade and uh, in which they've uh, grown and so it's I think very important that uh, as we look to uh, create competition that we understand that this shouldn't become the lowest common denominator. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, with regards to uh, national conservation areas, I think the uh, package there is much more mixed. Uh, but again, uh, I think that uh, without an organic act, without a basic mission or charter uh, within BLM uh, for these uh, conservation lands, it makes the task uh, uh, very difficult, each one being crafted in a customized uh, way. And as, a, as a, someone in a responsible area here, we have to look at the different missions of the various agencies. I think we want to make certain that we uh, do try and keep that, uh, that clear. So I'd be most interested. I am absolutely uh, uh, delighted that uh, you are engaged in those types of issues because, frankly, uh, uh, I just haven't heard anyone else discussing it, and it's the very questions that we're trying to, to answer. Uh, uh, in uh, the subcommittee and uh, in reference to members that bring proposals to me and, uh, and, to, the, uh, and to Chairman Miller. So I, I look forward to, to working with you uh, on uh, those, uh, those types uh, of issues. Uh, I mean, we've got more answers here in, in, uh, in two, uh, two, three hours than I've had in uh, ten years with regards to Department of Interior, and this is an orientation meeting. And uh, so I, I, it really is very helpful. One point I would make, uh, and that is I think you need to do something with the solicitor's office and with the Justice de Department. I am very uh, 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 optimistic about the, uh, the new uh, 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 designated or uh, uh, submitted name uh, uh, for the uh, Department of Justice, uh, 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 Attorney General Reno. Uh, especially with their concern about the environment, because I don't think that the Department of Interior has been well served by the Department of Justice in the past, whether it comes to land appraisals, whether it comes to other types of functions. And I just think we have to, we can solve a lot of our problems. When you began talking about water rights, and I thought of Dinosaur Monument, when we uh, yielded basically the water rights in Colorado when we should have appealed that particular decision, 
Uh, again, I think that, and that, that's history, but I think we really should not abandon those, uh, those issues, which I agree with you, are set aside when we set aside the, the unit. We didn't, uh, again, we meant parks to be uh, uh, special areas. Not all lands are created equal. Uh, some have special qualities uh, uh, which we uh, designate and recognize and try to preserve. Along those lines, I would just <coughs> further state that very often as we're, we're dealing with uh, land use issues and uh, uh, the permitting process, the, the mining claims, the RS-2477 uh, uh, issues, many that are very controversial, grazing uh, permits, Mr. Secretary, uh, not grazing rights. Uh, uh, we want to be very careful about that, uh, as you know. And uh, as we're dealing with those, I think very often that uh, there has developed, I think, and evolved while these had a legitimate uh, purpose. Uh, 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 historically, I think they've evolved into a feeling that they are a right, and I think that is, uh, that is something that we need to address. But uh, more importantly, and I find even this uh, to be the case a lot, of, a lot, many, most often within holdings within our public lands, that we find that very often uh, uh, individuals are there really uh, claiming a permit or a FERC permit within a park or on BLM lands, even in forest service areas, on streams, on rivers, uh, really not with the idea of developing that, with, but really with the idea of uh, staking a claim and then having the national government uh, 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 go to the Treasury and cash in to buy back that particular claim. I'm especially concerned about, for instance, the type of uh, development that uh, is taking place today around Lechagia. Uh, cave near uh, Carlsbad, in this sort of event where I think it could be avoided. Along those lines, I think that you get back really to our database and the types of plans that we have and updating them, for instance, and rewriting the BLM authorization bill and other uh, uh, proposals so that we don't necessarily have competition between the agencies, but I think what that may happen uh, in some cases, but what we really need is cooperation. We really need to get collaboration in terms of these issues, and I think you're right on track in terms of talking about developing the scientific base and information. Politics, we may differ, differ but we shouldn't uh, differ about the basic facts which drive these policy decisions. So rather than try to ask a whole host of questions here, I hope that we can develop a dialogue, and I'm very encouraged look forward to the legislative program and other initiatives that uh, obviously you're going to lead. And I hope you will take a lead role uh, in the uh, temperate uh, uh, rainforest uh, summit uh, that <laughs> is being proposed. It sounds to me like we're going to need that type of help from you and from the other leaders uh, in this administration, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DeLugo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I certainly uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Vento. This has been a, an excellent orientation and uh, been very helpful to all of us, certainly been helpful to this member. Uh, I just wanted to, to, um, to make, uh, to have an exchange with you, Mr. Secretary. Um, you heard the statement of uh, Congressman Fulia Mavenga when he was saying that uh, this has got to go over to the White House, this reorganization has to go over to the White House. And uh, I liked uh, your fire when you said you were not about to be stripped of jurisdiction 30 days into your stewardship, and uh, we don't expect you to be. I'd like to just say this, that the legislation, my legislation, and the legislation on the Senate side is not designed to strip the Secretary of Interior of jurisdiction. The Secretary of Interior doesn't have the jurisdiction at the present time to do the job for the insular areas. And these insular areas, which are treated very benevolently by the mother country, our colonies. We had a dynamite uh, conference this past week at uh, Georgetown University with a tremendous participation from uh, educators and elected officials from Guam, American Samoa, uh, from Palau, from the Virgin Islands, and from Puerto Rico. The, this legislation and this effort began years ago when we became com convinced that, that interior, as it's presently structured, could not deliver for the insular areas. <clears throat> and in fact, the legislation was uh, introduced um, before uh, you came to town. So this legislation certainly is not directed at you. And, and let me say this, Mr. Secretary, that you have, I know that you have the full confidence of the President. 
And if you want to take the lead, I will back you. I will tell you this, that when I hold the hearings, the insular areas are going to be very skeptical about Interior taking the lead because Interior has failed us so consistently through recent decades. Water Island that I spoke about is fully within the jurisdiction of Interior. It is a scandal. And it's going to become public pretty soon. It has got racial overtones, colonial overtones, and God knows what other overtones that it had to be passed through two days before the end of the Bush administration over the objections of the, the uh, chairman in both the House and Senate. It's 500 acres of land. The people that have built on this island have been, by and large, many of them have been subsidized by the federal taxpayer. This has to be looked at. But uh, our problem, Mr. Secretary, is that when it comes to the insular areas, let's take, for instance, uh, all of us, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Guam. Right now, the, uh, pr the president is coming forward with a package. We don't know what's going to happen there with the 936 uh, program. Uh, this is something that we have got to have a, a procedure in place within the administration uh, that can respond to the insular needs. It was recommended by the House that it be the White House. It could be just as well the Secretary of Interior. But for you to be able to do it, it's going to take legislation. You have to have the authority to be able to work with Treasury, to work with uh, the uh, Department of Health, to work with HUD, all of these other agencies that are important to us. The islands are now self-governing. It's not like the old days when the governor was, was an, a political appointee and uh, he answered to the Secretary of Interior. Now our governors are elected, and that's very recent. Only happened in 1970. So it, it is time to restructure. It is not attack on you, Mr. Secretary. And I would like to work with you to re, to, together to restructure this so that, so that the federal government can respond to the needs of 4.6 million U.S. citizens who are living in the insular areas, who cannot vote for president, who have no say in who is going to be their commander in chief. And I'd, I'd like to uh, get your response to that. Congressman, I agree with your objectives. I think we share those objectives, and I'm ready and willing to work with you. You know, you name the time and the place, and we'll get moving on this stuff, and we'll arm wrestle each other, and we'll figure it out. I'm ready to do that. Sounds great to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a great uh, orientation. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your, your time. I think, uh, as you can already tell from the remarks of this committee, uh, not only is your, uh, is your jurisdiction important to us and the decisions that you will make important to us, but also this morning you have deeply impressed this, uh, this committee. It's been a long time uh, since the Secretary of the Interior has sat at that table and given us direct answers to direct questions. It's a long time since the Secretary of Interior has sat at that table and known the answers to the questions that we have asked without being whispered in one ear or the other ear by somebody else. Uh, I said when I introduced you to many members of this committee uh, some weeks ago that not only have you uh, given a great deal of intellectual energy uh, and thought to these, uh, these issues, but you've also spilled political blood uh, and capital uh, over these issues uh, in, in, uh, in your service in public life. And I think already this committee can sense the difference uh, that, uh, that that will mean to the members of this committee as they struggle uh, to receive answers. Uh, assurances and to uh, to solve problems that affect their uh, uh, their constituents. This is truly a uh, a, a fresh uh, breeze blowing uh, 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 in this uh, in this room in terms of struggling to solve problems. I must tell you that the uh, the members of this committee spend uh, many 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 hours in trying to resolve these issues. 
not to make them more complicated, but simply to resolve them. And uh, during my time as chair of this committee and, and certainly as a member of this committee, we have struggled for months waiting for yes and no answers from a discussion even of the problems from the, uh, from the department. And uh, you can hear some of the frustration here. You can also hear much of the hope that this administration and your tenure in this office brings to this, uh, to this committee. I would hope that in the future uh, we would have the opportunity to sit down in small groups with you and, and members of your uh, department and members of this committee to, to discuss how we might handle some of these issues and how we might resolve them. Uh, sometimes I believe that uh, just dragging members of the administration up before the committee is, is, is somewhat counterproductive uh, and that we have an opportunity to provide those, uh, those alternative forums and, and, uh, uh, and discussions. And uh, uh, I think uh, it's been a long time since I've listened to uh, members of this committee invite a Secretary of the Interior to their district where they thought that would be a positive event. Uh, I'm not ready yet to... Uh, uh, to create the T-shirt of the, your, uh, the great secretarial tour of the USA, but, uh, uh, but I certainly look forward uh, uh, to your, kind of, your participation and cooperation with members of this committee. Uh, they chose this committee, uh, they work hard at it, and they represent some very, very difficult constituencies uh, uh, around these various issues. But we're willing to make that effort. I think clearly the President and you have signaled that uh, uh, that effort at, at cooperation, and I must really thank you very much uh, for spending this, uh, uh, this time and answering the questions in the direct fashion in which you did. We will have additional questions that members have submitted to me here in writing that we would like to forward to, uh, to you uh, for, uh, uh, for comment, and, uh, and thank you again very much for your time and, and, and your effort and, and uh, thoughtfulness here this morning. Chairman, I enjoyed it enormously. I look forward to doing it a whole lot. Thank you. Thank you. Committee stands adjourned. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded to serve the public by America's cable television companies.